good morning everyone we welcome you all to ortho tv online and in association with minimally invasive spine surgeons of association of bharat and uh, to introduce today's topics and speaker i hand over to our convener dr arvind kulkarni uh thank you uh, neeraj uh, so wish you all a uh, very happy and uh, prosperous and uh, highly uh, educative and safe uh, new year so this is the first webinar of uh, 2021 and uh, so we have an interesting topic and uh, an interesting uh, galaxy of faculty uh, uh, while the covid uh, curve ha, you know has surged up and has fallen down the surge of osteoporosis the incidence of osteoporosis and vertebral uh, uh, fractures uh, this particular graph keeps on uh, surging higher and higher in the society as we see in our clinical practice and this is one particular condition where minimal access has a great potential uh, uh, you know extending all the way from no treatment that is the least of uh, the surgery that is not doing you know treating this conservatively all the way till you know uh, uh, till doing a minimal access uh, multi level fixation and some uh, other modality modalities interesting modalities in between so uh, it is an elaborate topic and uh, i would uh, hand over the baton to dr amrit lal uh, will will uh, who will open up uh, uh, today's session to you amrit yeah thank you uh, dr arvind kulkarni uh, interesting to see that uh, uh, about your remark regarding uh, covid and uh, the present scenario interestingly most of in my practice a lot of cases have surgeries during the covid time and lockdown have been actually kyphoplasties more than traumas and uh, other uh, hey, hello yeah. so uh, kyphoplasty vertebroplasties and osteoporotic vertebral fractures are a very pertinent topic and uh, happens in the elderly and in in them minimal invasive uh, procedures are uh, preferable over large incision large dissection surgeries and uh, but at the same time having said that it's very controversial there are a lot of unanswered questions or there is a lot of confusion even in uh, existing literature regarding whether conservative treatment is uh, should be uh, preferred over surgical management whether uh, cementing is the ideal technique or whether fixation is uh, preferable and uh, what are the criteria for choosing between the different modalities of uh, surgical management as well as conservative so and what is the medical management at the end of it which is actually the main uh, solution for uh, prevention of uh, osteoporosis so in this uh, particular module in this session uh, we are trying to address all these uh, uh, aspects of management of osteoporotic fractures vertebral fractures and uh, we have eminent speakers from uh, across the country who are participating in this session and we also have uh, um, um, uh, two uh, journal articles to discuss uh, which will throw us uh, throw some light on to what is the existing scenario what the literature says and what are the controversies uh, which we are uh, facing with regarding uh, management of osteoporotic vertebral fractures so uh, the first speaker would be dr sumit sinha he is from delhi he is a spine surgeon and uh, every, most most people in india uh, know him very well he doesn't need uh, any great introduction um, and uh, over to you dr sumit thank you dr amrit uh, for that uh... uh introduction and uh, so i will share my screen now can you all hear me now yeah okay so um thanks at the outset uh, for the misab uh, to give me an opportunity to be with you in this wonderful morning winter morning it's winters in delhi and delhi winters are very well known and um Uh, thank you arvind for that wonderful favor uh, it's i'm very very obliged and uh, privileged to have uh, myself among all of you and hope uh, this uh, 10 minute talk will uh, 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 will benefit uh, the residents and the young practitioners 
um, for this very important minimally invasive technique for uh, vertebral body augmentation. So I have very little time to explain a lot. So I, without wasting any further time, I was being told to, to, uh, to tell the indications and uh, the technique. So I will uh, particularly stick to the indications and the technique. So coming straight away to the indications, uh, uh, I think there is a lecture on the medical management uh, by the guest lecturer. So uh, I would like to take in this slide the fractures which are less likely to improve with the standard medical management. And these are the ones which uh, straight away, which have, which should have a low threshold for doing uh, uh, this procedure of kyphoplasty. So these are the fractures at the thoracolumbar junction, a burst fracture where there is a fracture in the posterior uh, vertebral body wall. There is a wedge compression fracture with more than 30 degrees of sagittal angulation or a vacuum shadow you see in the X-ray or the CT scans in the, in the fractured body, which suggests an ischemic necrosis of the bone. Or when you have a patient with progressively increasing backache um, uh, and progressive co increasing collapse of the vertebral body on radiologic follow-ups. So these are the fractures which are less likely to improve on conservative management and therefore should have a low threshold for doing these uh, minimally invasive procedures of kyphoplasty. So there are two techniques, um, uh, either directly injecting cement into the vertebral body called as vertebral plasty, uh, which uh, some other speaker is um, already speaking. And the other one is kyphoplasty where you create a space by a balloon and into that space you inject a seat, uh, the cement. So these are the treatments, minimally invasive treatments for OCFs. And the goal of vertebroplasty is to confer the strength and stability, whereas the kyphoplasty is said to have to, to restore the vertebral body height also, in addition to increasing the strength and hence thereby it improves the sagittal alignment. So these are the indications, patients who have failed the conservative therapy, patients who uh, uh, have the pain, uh, which is strictly localizable to the fracture level. And this is very, very important for the success of your uh, kyphoplasty treatment. And another important uh, aspect is the duration of the pain from the fracture should be greater than six weeks, but less than one year or max of two years, because after that, the, uh, the uh, results of kyphoplasty in terms of pain relief, they uh, sharply decline. The contraindications are severe wedge deformity. I already told comminuted burst fracture because in that there is a risk of cement leakage into the spinal canal. And there's canal compromise of more than 20%, epidural tumor extension, inability to lie prone, and of course, uncorrected coagulopathies and inability to localize the source of pain. So clinical examination is very, very important in if, if you want to have a good surgical outcome with this technique. These are the mechanism of pain relief in vertebral body augmentation. And uh, uh, now coming to the preoperative evaluation, I told you that complete neurological examination is the most important thing which uh, you should have to consider uh, while selecting your patients in the in your OPD clinic for this procedure, the pain should be strictly localizable to the collapsed vertebral level. Uh, you get an X-ray level, X-ray of the of the involved level, AP and lateral view. Then the CT scan should show uh, if it shows the posterior cortical disruption. Probably he's not a nice candidate for. Uh, doing a kyphoplasty bone scan. Some people do. I don't prefer, preferably do it because it shows um, a, a hot spot and it localizes the symptomatic level. Uh, nowadays, non-invasive MRI is uh, a more better indicator of uh, detecting the acuteness of fracture or differentiating the fracture from a malignant fracture. Now, this is the X-ray. You see the collapse of the vertebral body in the AP and the lateral view. Here, in this case, the superior end plate is dipped, uh, suggesting a collapse. And in this MRI, and it is particularly important to see in this MRI, especially the T2-weighted or still images, they show a hyper-intense signal on T2-weighted images, uh, which suggest that the fracture is less than four months old. If you see a high-intense signal, on the T2-weighted images and a low intense signal on the T1-weighted images. This suggests that this fracture is probably less than four months old and this helps in selecting the patients uh, for the kyphoplasty treatment. Now, one important investigation which is intraoperatively done is vertebral body venography. And it suggests that if the contrast runoff from the vertebral, vertebral body is rapid, 
then shunting into the IVC is likely. So you have to be very careful, but I don't do it on a regular basis, especially I, I like to do it in, in high risk patients where there is a, there is the, which are very, very low within, in GC profile where there is a high risk of medical complications and uh, uh, hemodynamic and unstable areas. Uh, so uh, from T5 to L5 in vertebroplasty can be cannulated through the pedicles and howsoever in kyphoplasty from T10 to L5. And uh, uh, this is done and this is the uh, paraphernalia which is required. Uh, there is a monomer, liquid monomer and there is a powder. So we mix both of these in a particular ratio and uh, five cc of liquid monomer is there uh, for every 20 cc of powder. And how do we decide that this is ready for injection? Uh, this is the consistency which decides, it's a peculiar consistency which is the, uh, said to be addressed by different names like caulking material is stiff without sheen. It, has, it does not drip on its own. And this generally happens in, within seven to 15 minutes. So um, there are various uh, companies available and uh, I need not name them, but um, I mean, all of them are equally good uh, while using this. So particularly technique, coming to the technique, you have to visualize the pedicles, and this is the crux of this surgery. And uh, to localize the pedicles, you have to do an AP view, first of all. And as I have depicted in this illustration, the entry into the pedicle, um, as we all, ent uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 it should be divided into three parts and at the three o'clock position on the lateral side of the pedicle, the uh, entry point is there. And then the direction of the needle should be uh, directed towards the anterior inferior corner of the vertebral body. So this is the desired trajectory. And you see that the accurate placement of the needle has to be done in the anterior third of the vertebral body. And um, because it is said that the anterior half sustains 80% of the load and the main venous drainage of the vertebral body begins at the midpoint of the uh, anterior posterior dimension of the vertebral body. So this is the ideal location where you have to place your needle. So if the patient has a superior fracture, then the tool should be placed inferior to the midline. And if the fracture is through the inferior plate, then it should be placed just superior to the midline of the vertebral body. So this is what is generally done. And if the height of vertebral body is 1.5 centimeter or less, the needle should be aimed at the midpoint of the anterior cortex on the lateral view. However, kyphoplasty, it is said it is very difficult or probably impossible to do if the vertebral body height is less than 9 mm. So the, 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 the device, the inflation pressure of the device, the, now this is the device uh, which is shown in the upper figure and the lower figure, uh, which through which you inject the bone, uh, the, 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 bone um, the, the contrast. So um, this device has a pressure reading on this, uh, on, on the top of mount. Uh, and uh, this pressure reading is said to have to not to exceed more than two, 220 PSI. And this pressure reading has to be uh, increased in um, five to 10 PSI intervals. And then you have to wait for some time, look for the hemodynamic instabilities in the patient, ask the anesthetist if the patient is fine. And then you have to do this pressure increments in a gradual incre increment doses. And do not have to inflate it at once. So the inflation should stop when the desired reduction is achieved on the lateral and the AP X-ray, when the proximity of the uh, inflatable device to the cortical walls as seen on the AP and the lateral and the oblique views has been achieved, when the pressure readings are a maximum of 220, you're not allowed to uh, inflate more than this. And uh, when the maximum rated volumes um, from the inflation syringe, they are reached. This is 4 ml for the 15 millimeter length or 6 ml for the 20 millimeter length. So I already said inflate in small volume increments alternating on both the sides. So uh, this is how it looks like when it is the final product. Pain is elevated generally with 3 ml of the, of the, of the bone cement as effectively as the larger volumes. However, if the stability is also a desired goal with kyphoplasty, volumes that more adequately fill the body they are necessary. Now, this is a sequential step of how the kyphoplasty next three minutes, I will be showing two minute video and uh, one minute this slide is, is very important to make you understand about the technique of this kyphoplasty procedure. Now, this is the preoperative x-ray of this patient showing a collapsed superior end plate. 
and uh, we get a CT done, confirm the findings, and therefore this is a patient who is localizing his pain on the level of the collapsed vertebral body. So this patient is suitable for the kyphoplasty technique. Patient lies prone, and mostly it is done under uh, mild sedation. However, if the patient is not cooperative or low general condition, also you may choose not a low general condition, then you can choose to do it under the general anesthesia. It is a 15 minutes job and uh, can discharge the patient the very same day or maybe the next day at the most. So the first uh, thing which you do is to insert a Jamshidi needle and uh, you find the pedicle, locate the pedicle. This is the pedicle entry point you see in the adjacent X-ray on the slide and uh, you see both in the AP and the lateral view. So this is very important. You have to confirm your needle position both on the AP and the lateral views at the same time. So once the Jamshidi is inserted, then you take out the, uh, the uh, stelate of the Jamshidi and through the cannula, the, you insert the, the K wire as you see in this figure. So this is the next step. You insert the K wire and then over the K wire, you uh, uh, you uh, take your uh, cannula, uh, the cement cannula, and then you insert your cement cannula again. And uh, you see this uh, in the X-ray, the K wire is being inserted and you make a trajectory and then insert a, a drill guide also, make a trajectory. And then after you make a trajectory with the drill guide, you uh, insert your cannula as is shown in the X-ray. Now this cannula, through this cannula, you insert your uh, balloon. Uh, and, uh, if you, um, you can see in this picture, you insert the balloon on both the sides simultaneously, one by one, through this cannula. And uh, the placement of the, uh, the, 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 the balloon wire, now you see this uh, in the lateral X-ray, there are two dots on the balloon wire. So these two dots should lie on the maximum, uh, maximum reduction in the vertebral body height now these because the balloon will uh, expand in between these two dots only uh, so wherever you want a maximum expansion of the vertebral body you place these dots directly beneath that so this is a very important point uh, if you want to have a correct uh, inflation of the vertebral body and also that the posterior dot should not be very close to the posterior cortical surface because in that case when you inject the bone cement it, there are chances that the cement might uh, spill over into the spinal canal. And this is the final product. So now lastly, the small short video of two minutes. So this is the vertebral body, which is collapsed and which is being... Now you can use the navigation system if you have, or also it can also be done under fluoroscopic guidance. So this is the navigation. This was done when I was at AIMS. I was a rich guy and I used... Confirm uh, now. Hello, um, however, if, uh, if you don't have, you can also do it on the fluoroscopy, which is absolutely required for this procedure. So uh, putting in a jump, uh, putting in a K wire after putting in a jump CD, when you put in the K wire, take out the jump CD. And you should be very careful while taking out the jump CD because hold the K wire, this K wire will be a roadmap for you for placing further instruments into the vertebral body. So it, it, the only thing which you have to be careful about this during this procedure is that the K-wire should not get dislodged. Uh, now putting in a uh, cannula yeah, the, yeah, yeah, it's okay, and no. looking into the I'm lateral x-ray and removing the K-wire. Now the cannula is, will be there, cannula on both the sides will I'm be on, there through which you take your balloon in, on both the sides. Okay. Uh, now, this, this balloon carries the contrast and you because have you see this this is you you rotate this piston so shape the device the as well. we start the and then you inject the contrast into the vertical yeah. body what happens is the balloon swells with the contrast and makes the space into the contrast vertical body and makes way for the future cement injection sure. Questions we should take uh, before inject yes sir huh? we are seeing you sir Okay, so, that's so it. That normally if you're not product. using navigation, then uh, there are... Okay, so um, complications, yes, we ha do have complications like cement leakage, pulmonary embolism, uh, adjacent fractures after the kyphoplasty procedure and infections. So OCF, uh, 
osteoporotic compression fractures, they cause significant morbidity in the elderly. They can be tried for conservative management for four to six weeks. However, if it is not, uh, and I told you the fractures which are not likely to respond to conservative management should have a low pro threshold profile for treating with kyphoplasty. So vertebral body augmentation, uh, one to two weeks can be done for kyphoplasty to almost a year um, uh, and uh, with the vertebral plasty. Careful patient selection is mandatory. And uh, uh, believe me, it is a dramatic pain relief procedure in osteoporotic comp uh, compression fracture patient soon inside the operation theater after the procedure uh, says completely relieved of his debilitating back pain. And it is safe with minimal complications if proper technique is followed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sumit. Just uh, uh, since you are in, a, you have to be elsewhere, I'll just ask a, one simple question. Uh, when, you, yes. when you decide on how, uh, which are the ones which uh, you would not do a kyphoplasty for, which are the cases that you would not do, uh, fractures which you wouldn't do kyphoplasty for? You're asking me about the indications for not doing a kyphoplasty. Yes, yes. Is it's, it? In your experience, they may, it's not frank uh, uh, dislocations or anything, but those subtle signs where you would not do a kyphoplasty and probably do uh, some fixation along with it. See, the most important thing is I check the height of the vertebral body. The height of the vertebral body is less than 0.9. Uh, centimeter, like 9 mm, I do not do kyphoplasty because it is very difficult to take in your needle and uh, the whole of the device and expand the balloon into this paper thin bone. Secondly, the most important thing is that I check the posterior cortical uh, wall uh, because uh, if it is fractured, then there are chances that you might have a spillover into the spinal canal with disastrous consequences. So these are the two important points which I uh, refrain from doing a kyphoplasty procedure. Okay, so uh, anybody else in the panel would like to comment on the posterior cortical break? Anybody uh, try, uh, does a kyphoplasty despite uh, having a posterior cortical break in uh, after surgery? Actually, I will be speaking on a more recent procedure where we can use for posterior burst fracture also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, we can be done, but I'm talking specifically about kyphoplasty. Kyphoplasty, so it is. No, kyphoplasty is a modified vertebroplasty. So when it is a burst, your cement is going to leak because you are just creating a bigger void and injecting more amount of cement. So you should have some barrier posteriorly when you are using cement. Okay. Kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty indications are relatively same in such situation. Okay. So the technique of injecting posteriorly is what you are going. <clears throat> Going I'm to... going to talk on vessel plasty, the implant which we have developed. Okay. Dr. Arvind Kulkarni? To me, uh, just one point. Uh, why would you prefer kyphoplasty? It's a very tricky question. Before you leave, why would you uh, do kyphoplasty uh, in favor of uh, vertebroplasty? Why? Why? You... Well, yeah. Just kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, generally, um, in my experience, I had done maybe, if I have done 100 of these procedures, I have done 99 kyphoplasties and one vertebral plasty. So the only indication that I could find is both of them are very similar techniques. But in my experience, kyphoplasty generally uh, sounds theoretically better than vertebral plasty because it creates a space. It requires less pressure of an injection. Uh, theoretically, maybe lesser complications. And of course, practically also, more stability and more correction of the sagittal alignment if more kyphosis is there preoperatively. So that is the reason which I favor kyphoplasty. I know of my colleagues who are better off with the vertebral plasty and having wonderful results. But in my experience, I am more safe, more comfortable with doing a kyphoplasty for the reasons I mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Ranjit. Hello. Yeah, Amrit, tell me. Yeah, Ranjit, uh, Dr. Sumit brought in an a very interesting point that there has to be point tenderness at, uh, at the level of the fracture. But uh, many a times I've found that the fracture will be at D12 and uh, the pain will be lower down because of muscle spasm. And I still do a kyphoplasty and they get very good relief. What are your thoughts on that clinical aspect of it? Yeah, so uh, for me, one of the most important thing is to, you know, is to know exactly 
can't hear you. Osteobotic fracture. Okay. So like what you said, it's a very, very uh, tricky situation many times that you don't have the pain at the right side. But I rely more at that point of time when I, when I, when I decide to go in for uh, an intervention, I rely more, more on radiology at that point of time to decide, to decide my uh, uh, site of action like mobility on the x-ray, cleft sign on the MRI, on the x-ray and MRI, and uh, um, uh, along with the tenderness. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sumit Sina. Thank for, you. Bro. Uh, Thank a you. wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, we'll <coughs> proceed to the next part of the... What about the cost? I'm, so, I'm sorry to leave. I mean, I have to join at some other place if everyone is uh, allows me. So if, I mean, can I leave? Yeah, I'm sorry, sure. I, so Amrit, if you can tell me, I can come back if required from the from yeah. that meeting. If I'm required here for the yeah, question and, answer, yeah, please, please do join later. Yeah. Thank please you. do join Thank you. around the end by around ten fifteen. That would be great. Yeah, correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Yeah. So the next uh, next we go into the. Uh, the journal club uh, section of the presentation of this uh, today's session. Um, I call upon Dr. Shavik Sinha, who's uh, practicing in Trivandrum. He's an uh, aspiring budding spine surgeon, and uh, I would like uh, him to uh, share his screen and make his presentation. So, the module of the journal club is that uh, he would sp uh, speak on, uh, he would speak in detail about a particular uh, article. And then uh, at the end of it, we would uh, take his inputs as well as analyze the journal. Thank you. Over to you, Shavik Sina. Thank you, sir. So is it visible? Yeah. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, the problems uh, regarding the osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture right now is the primary treatment modules uh, for osteoporotic vertebral fracture uh, uh, of uh, is a conservative, which is medical management. However, in some patients, conservative treatment may lead to non-union or pseudoarthrosis of OVCF and result in delayed neurological deficit that requires uh, surgical intervention. And lacuna in literature, the uh, criteria for predicting and determining the bone union have not been established and standardized early follow-up criteria for conservative management of OVCFs for predicting the outcome is still at gray zone. For that, uh, Kozo Sato et al. from Japan in 2020, they have uh, published an article on vertebral mobility is a valuable indicator for predicting and determining the bone union in osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture. The advantage of this study is initial assessment was done with plane radiograph and MRI and follow-up was done using plane radiographs only, plane lateral radiographs only and use vertebral mobility as criteria for assessment and can be followed up, which can be followed up at any center. Aimed to investigate the usefulness of vertebral mobility for determining the uh, determining and predicting the bone union at six months of uh, osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture onset. And vertebral mobility was defined as the difference uh, in anterior vertebral height between lateral radiographs taken in weight bearing, which is sitting position and non weight bearing, which is supine and lateral decubitus position. To determine bone union, uh, to determine bone union, the vertebral mobility cutoff of one millimeter was decided at six months. Was taken as primary objective. Also compared the vertebral mobility cutoff values of 1.5 millimeter and two millimeter to demonstrate the difference in bone union rates. They also aim to calculate the cutoff value of vertebral mobility in anterior vertebral height at five weeks after uh, osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture onset for predicting the bone union estimated with cutoff values of one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter, two millimeter for bone union at six months after OVCF for comparing the outcome. The previous available studies uh, in 2008, uh, Kawasaki et al. Uh, reported a vertebral mobility cutoff value of two millimeter in anterior vertebral height for diagnosing fresh OVCF. In 2011, Chen uh, et al. reported a vertebral mobility cutoff of same two millimeter of anterior vertebral height for non-mobile OVCF in study on mobile intervertebral cleft in OVCFs. In 2014, Nimi et al. reported the same cutoff value for diagnosing the acute OVCF as Kawasaki et al. And in 2019, Kitaguchi et al. reported 
that the bony union could be defined as the absence of vertebral cleft or abnormal motion. So they use the inclusion criteria of primary OVCF with wedge pattern only. Uh, OVCFs between T11 to L3 level, acute OVCFs within three weeks of onset and with at least three consecutive available radiographs for evaluation. They excluded the pathological fracture, which is tumor or infection, steroid induced uh, osteoporosis, concave vertebra without vertebral mobility at uh, anterior vertebral height, post surgical OVCFs, and current OVCFs treated elsewhere in patients and with low quality radiographs. For that, uh, 53 eligible patients with uh, 54 OVCFs were enrolled for this uh, study. A male were uh, 12 and female were 41. Mean age was 82 with a wide range of uh, variation from 55 to 97 years. And the number of uh, different levels, uh, thoracic lumbar junction was the most common. They uh, used the management protocol of the bed rest until the severity of the back pain subsided significantly to the enable uh, them to sit. While those with middle column injuries uh, were in bed rest for three weeks, irrespective of the pain status. They asked the patient to lie on bed in lateral decubitus position to prevent loosening of the fracture site in spine until detection of the bone union after discharge. A walking aid was used to lessen the compression and for, uh, forward bending forces on the affected vertebra. Elastic corset uh, they commonly used where semi-hard corset were used in patients with middle column injuries only. A regular exercise involving walking and trunk muscle strengthening was implemented. The radiographic assessment the plane radiographs uh, were taken in sitting lateral decubitus and supine, where the tube and tube to film uh, distance was standard 120 centimeter, and obtained with the same uh, same machine with same uh, resolution. The measurement, the dimensions of vertebral body, anterior vertebral height and posterior vertebral height in millimeter was taken. Vertebral mobility, which was defined as change in uh, anterior vertebral height between sitting and decub lateral decubitus radiograph or between sitting and uh, supine radiographs. And local kyphosis angle uh, was also taken uh, into account, where, which is defined as cob angle between the cranial end plate of the vertebra, cranial to the affected vertebra, and the caudal end plate vertebra, caudal to the affected vertebra. The precision errors, uh, errors were calculated for uh, anterior vertebral height and posterior vertebral height on uh, radiographs of five randomly selected fractures, uh, fractured and intact vertebra, and expressed as percentage coefficients of variation. The respective coefficients of variation for affected and intact vertebra were uh, 2% uh, plus minus 1% and 1.1% for uh, anterior vertebral height, whereas 1.5% and 0.9% for uh, posterior vertebral height. The reliability of the measurements were also assessed uh, with the, uh, the anterior vertebral height and posterior vertebral height of the affected vertebra. Uh, posterior vertebral height of cranial and caudal vertebra to that uh, fractured vertebra and local kyphosis angle was independently measured by two authors. And the intra-observer reliability was uh, significant and inter-observer reliability was also significant. They defined the bone union and semi-union as the bone union, the vertebra with vertebral mobility less than one millimeter between sitting and lateral uh, supine position and uh, no intervertebral cleft on supine radiograph. Whereas they defined semi-union of the vertebra with uh, where the vertebral mobility is less than one millimeter between sitting and lateral decubitus position and no vertebral cleft on a lateral decubitus radiograph. The radiographic follow-up, the initial evaluation principally based on sitting and supine radiograph to demonstrate the maximum vertebral mobility. Whereas the subsequent radiographs every three weeks during hospitalization and every six weeks at outpatient clinic in sitting and lateral decubitus only. After detection of the semi-union or similarly stable uh, OVCFs on sitting and lateral decubitus radiograph, the patients were assessed with sitting and supine radiographs to ascertain the OVCF union. When bone union was detected, follow-up of the current uh, OVCF uh, was finished and the measurement at that, this time was defined as the final evaluation. And when a semi-union was not followed up, the semi-union was treated like a bone union and the measurement of that time was defined as the final evaluation. The number of OVCFs available for uh, predicting bone union at six months by receiver operating uh, characteristic curve analysis in sitting and decubitus radiograph were 26 OVCFs in the initial evaluation and 44 OVCFs in five weeks after OVCF. As a result, the vertebral deformity, uh, the extent of vertebral deformity of initial evaluation present with uh, the anterior vertebral height and 
local kyphosis angle differed significantly among sitting decubitus and uh, supine position as uh, is depicted here in the chart so in sitting uh, position the uh, height was 17.7 mm whereas in lateral decubitus it's opened up to 19.2 and supine position 23.4 and uh, in union, uh, after union, the sitting position anterior vertebral height was 17.3, whereas supine is 17.7 for the same patients. The time course of bone healing, about two thirds of OVCFs were united or semi-united within six months after OVCF onset and remaining OVCFs were united thereafter in this study. Uh, treatment outcome, the cumulative rate of bone union and semi-union were 72.4% and 25.5%. The mean vertebral deformity value on sitting radiograph didn't differ significantly between the initial and final evaluations, whereas the uh, local kyphosis angle slowed, uh, showed slight but significant progression. The number of bone unions and semi unions, according to the three kinds of vertebral mobility of uh, anterior vertebral height. The difference between the respective union rates became smaller over time for vertebral mobility cutoff values of one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter and two millimeter of uh, anterior vertebral height. And in this study, they saw 90% of the bone union arose from a semi-union situations. So in this uh, different cutoff values used uh, for defining the union and semi-union. In Dr. three Suri, months values, the uh, one millimeter cutoff values. Please try and wind it up in one minute. Thanks. Uh, in one millimeter cutoff value, uh, three, in three months result, 41.2% uh, bone union rate was there. Whereas in 1.5 millimeter, 59.6% and two millimeters, 71.2%. And in final uh, result, there was no much difference in three cutoff values. So uh, vertebral cutoff value in uh, anterior vertebral height at fifth week for predicting the bone union at six months after OVCF. They use the, uh, the cutoff value in anterior vertebral height at five weeks for predicting the bone union used as 2.1 millimeter, three millimeter and three millimeter respectively. And it has a moderate degree of predicting accuracy, predictability accuracy. The cutoff values for vertebral mobility in the initial evaluation showed low accuracy for predicting bone union in the six months after OVCF. So the cumulative number of bone union, including the semi-union, were variable, particularly in the uh, early months after OVCFs, depending on the vertebral mobility cutoff values of bone union. And the cumulative number of bone unions were less apparently influenced by the three vertebral mobility cutoff values uh, of bone union than the cumulative number of semi-unions. The cutoff uh, values on sitting and lateral decubitus radiographs taken in five weeks after OVCF could predict the bone union, including semi union, at six months after OVCF with moderate accuracy. The vertebral mobility cutoff values obtained in the initial uh, evaluation showed lower accuracy. And the patients hospitalized at more than 10 days on average after OVCF uh, onset required a longer period of bone union than the remaining patients who were hospitalized at four days on average. The reason why the cumulative uh, number of bone union was less influenced by the three vertebral mobility cutoff values for uh, bone union is likely to be that the bone unions were determined after they had become stable in vertebral mobility of less than one millimeter in uh, anterior vertebral height in sitting and lateral decubitus x-ray. And semi-union was treated like bone union because the semi-union was already stable as, as, uh, at less than one millimeter of vertebral mobility in anterior height in sitting and lateral decubitus uh, radiographs. And it was confirmed in this study that 90% of the bone unions arose from a semi-union situation. An intervertebral cleft was reported to occur at about three weeks after OVCF onset with inadequate treatment during the early stage. It has to be considered as one of the finding indica indicator for delayed union or non-union. Lack of cleft should be included as a, a criteria for uh, determining the bone union. Takahashi et al. reported that vertebral angular motion of more than five degree on sitting and supine radiographs at both enrollment and one month follow-up was a risk factor for delayed union at six months after OVCF with low accuracy. The conclusion earlier adequate intervention is key factor for OVCF treatment. The vertebral mobility cutoff values of uh, at about 
five weeks after OVCF may be more accurate for predicting bone union at six months than those in early stage of OVCF. Patients with vertebral mobility of less than one, uh, 2.1 millimeter at five weeks had 70.5% bone union rate at six months using one millimeter cutoff value and standardization of bone union definition is required for further studies. The limitation of this study was small number of OVCF included and the case registration period was long. The follow-up radiograph sitting in lateral decubitus was taken, uh, avoiding the supine. Therefore, it is likely that vertebral mobility was determined and the bone union rate was overestimated in sitting and lateral decubitus radiographs. No control group for uh, patients who lay in supine uh, during the treatment and therefore the pro, uh, potential advantage of lying in decubit lateral decubitus for bone union and or prevention of the vertebral deformity remains unclear. The drawbacks of this study, the medical management was not mentioned uh, properly in this uh, study. A radiographic scaling error may come in different uh, machine setup. The single level versus multi-level involvement was not in, uh, mentioned and outcome associated with the bone mineral density values were not mentioned. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Suvik. Uh, interesting study when it comes to understanding the union. Why, why did you feel that uh, this was a, why did you choose this study for uh, discussion? What was the, how would it have an impact on uh, uh, the concepts surrounding vertebral fracture management. So the uh, main thing is that uh, this uh, study has used a only ba basic uh, investigation that is lateral radiograph for uh, follow up, which can be done anywhere, uh, even if there is there is no uh, spine setup. For general practitioners also, they can follow up the cases. General orthopedic surgeons. Okay. Right. So, uh, most of the time, uh, we compare unions of any fracture, whether it's long bone or vertebral fractures or flat bones, we, come, we associate it with functional recovery or uh, functional abilities also. In this yes, study, sir. did they have anything no, of sir. that kind? They, they, have not mentioned, they have not mentioned anything about that in this study. Even uh, no delayed neurological deficit also, they have not mentioned anything about that. Because I think uh, uh, many a times we uh, treat patients uh, based on their uh, pain scores and uh, their functional ability, irrespective, and, but we still find that they have some cleft and there's a lot of collapse, amount of vertebral collapse may be significant, but still we are, uh, we are treating them uh, without any, we are accepting it as a, an acceptable outcome. So have there been cases in this study where uh, there has been non-union and there has been, uh, so they have one, changed one the case plan of, no, sir. Uh, one, one case of non-union was mentioned where the cleft sign, uh, intervertebral cleft remained in the supine position. So only one case of non-union so, they have mentioned in this study. So uh, broadly speaking, this study says that most, uh, most fractures will unite conserv conservatively treated. Yes, sir. Um, what about uh, the point about hospitalization? Why were, why were patients hospitalized for 10 days? Sir, uh, was there a they, reason to go to 10 days? For sir, uh, they have mentioned not 10 days. The patients got admitted after 10 days of active ah. OVCF. They are okay. having the delayed union rate than those are who are getting admitted earlier for uh, the bed rest and all immobilization. Okay, they, they, are, were, they were admitting patients for immobilization. They were yes, not... sir. Okay. Pain management and immobilization. Okay. I guess, uh, Dr. Arvind, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, so it's a very good uh, paper because basically, if you read uh, any of the papers related to timing of vertebroplasty in osteoporotic mm -hmm. compression fractures, when you compare uh, vertebroplasty against uh, conservative treatment, you will see that over a period of six months, at the end of six to eight months, the uh, degree of pain, the VAR score is the same. So, most of these fractures unite over a period of time. Even there is a cleft, over a period of time, the cleft collapses, they end in kyphosis, but over a period of six to eight months, they, the pain level is similar to what you achieve with vertebroplasty at the end of six to eight months. The advantage of these procedures is early pain relief, that's all. So that goes well with this study. So 
uh, and the only thing is there are some predictive factors but ultimately since all of them fuse or all of them united 6 to 8 months uh, there is there any point in finding out the predictive factor <laughs> right that's uh, that's uh, true that's interesting i would like to know dr arvind his uh, thoughts on this matter dr arvind bave whether where, do you do you uh, prefer to get them up and uh, moving early or are you okay with uh, waiting for 6 months no or, yeah. two thing two three things uh, what we have observed is particularly obese patients with multiple medical comorbidities they are candidates to develop dvt if you keep them in bed for long time that is one so these are the cases where we would go ahead with vertebral stabilization augmentation and mobilize them as early because healing is going to be the similar we are just adding number two is we are preventing the kyphosis by putting or giving some anterior support we are preventing the kyphosis which occurs late so these are the two important things where our additional indications for intervention will depend for the fractures which are stable not uh, collapsing in follow up x rays i would just go conservatively with good anti osteoporotic treatment for them i am not advising any type of surgical intervention dr uh, uh, dr manish kotari do you feel that uh, do you do this uh, sitting supine uh, <laughs> Uh, lateral decubitus x-rays do you find that useful or do you do a uh, regular flexion extension dynamic views dr manish hello yeah 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 i routinely do uh, sitting and uh, standing x-rays especially when the pain is uh, not getting better or persisting beyond 3 weeks 4 weeks so my usual protocol is first around 10 days 2 weeks of uh, limited bed rest not complete but allowed with some privileges and then gradually allow mobilization so if the pain is not following the usual or a, a, a better trajectory the pain scores then i look start looking at these things and if it is collapsing uh, significantly then i would probably you know counsel and prime the patient for an early intervention but if the uh, fracture is otherwise stable then uh, you are probably you know uh, in for a longer conservative treatment rather than early intervention that is so yeah what about yeah i have one question Yes. What about uh, use of teriparatide or uh, for all these patients? I mean, do you recommend to start teriparatide when the patients are diagnosed, or would you wait for six to eight weeks for to see if they heal by themselves, or if the healing is delayed, then then start teriparatide? Yeah, definitely, uh, teriparatide would be based also not only on established uh, vertebral fractures but also on doing a bone density. and on finding a bone density uh, of less than minus 2.5 with a osteoporotic compression fracture i would start the teriparatide early as early as possible but doesn't like if a patient has osteoporotic fracture doesn't it mean that he has uh, he has a, uh, the bmd is less than minus 2.5 i mean a trivial trauma causing a fracture itself is an true what whatever it is an osteoporotic when we think it's a trivial trauma and osteoporotic fracture also we should go through the whole uh, evaluation sequence we have to look at the pth values we have to do an mri make sure that it's not anything else and uh, check calcium levels uh, check the creatinine liver function there are so many other secondary causes of osteoporosis also mm-hmm. so uh, we shouldn't be uh, going in directly into a medical management without having an idea of what our patient is like i mean his protoplasm and his uh, comorbidities and then we should be going into any definitive uh, medical management so uh, and part of that evaluation is also a bone density testing so we have to put them through a basic uh, evaluation before we start them just based on an x ray what do you say dr ranjit what do you think of that that's uh, actually uh, arvind uh, no um, uh, amrit yeah today my indication for all these interventions have come down drastically drastically means i i have come down 19% i don't have to do anything thanks to the wonderful drugs available so whenever right. whenever whenever i have a indication for a intervention it's purely because of mechanical reasons and okay. those are the events i end up doing not just a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty i end up instrumenting them doing all that what is required 
So the, the standalone vertebroplasty or kephoplasty is almost nil for me today because they all heal with proper medical therapy. Okay. Would you start the medical therapy based on uh, x-ray or would it be after a BMD and an MRI? And so for me, any patient who comes with a significant vertebral fracture is already a severe osteoporosis. I don't wait for them to give them, therapy, uh, give them zolonic acid, etc., for which the onset of action starts after one year. So the fastest drug not to cause pain relief is teriparatide, wherein I expect the micro instability to settle by three to six weeks. Okay. So those patients are, whatever fracture indications is, I start them with teriparatide. When you pick up a osteoporosis for non-other reasons, like you do a DEXA for a back pain, you pick up something, patient has time, where I go ahead and you use a zolonic acid. But still the drug of choice is teriparatide. Okay. Anod sir is there. He definitely he'll be yeah. having much more information to. Yes. Uh, to we'll, we'll go into more into detail of that towards the end of this uh, session. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now I call upon uh, Dr. Tushar to uh, make his presentation on uh, an, uh, another journal club. I think he's doing a review of uh, a few articles and giving us his uh, uh, the gist of it in a digested form. So uh, Dr. Tushar again is a young uh, spine surgeon who's practice. He's from Mumbai. Over to you, Doc, Dr. Tushar Kundar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, please try to keep it to 10 minutes, the presentation, yes, so sir. that we can have some discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I believe everyone can have uh, see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Tushar, uh, and I am going to talk about this burning controversy which is surrounding vertebroplasty. Uh, it all started in uh, 2009 when... Um, Buchbinder, uh, Buchbinder et al. and Calmis et al. They published in tandem in the New England Journal of Medicine and came down heavily on vertebroplasty. So now let's dive deep and have a look at what they had to say in these articles. The Buchbinder trial of 2009, it showed 78 participants were randomly uh, divided into vertebroplasty group and the control group. Uh, they all had suffered painful osteoporotic fractures, uh, duration of less than 12 months. It was a double-binded high-quality study. And the primary outcome uh, measured was uh, pain uh, from 1 to 10. They found no beneficial effect of vertebroplasty over the placebo sham procedure at one week, one month, three months, or six months post-procedure. Uh, the next was the Calmis trial of the 2009. Uh, 131 patients from multiple centers across the continent were randomly assigned into the vertebroplasty group and the sham uh, procedure group. These patients had suffered an osteoporotic fracture duration being less than 12 months. Primary outcome was scored on Roland Disabilities Questionnaire. They found that the pain and disability improvements in both the vertical plastic group and the sham group were similar. Now, uh, to give perspective to everyone, the sham procedure was something uh, they used to do everything uh, till the installation of uh, anesthetic into the uh, periosteal region and they will not uh, put the cement inside, whereas they would mix the cement in the room to give, uh, to give the patient uh, uh, a feel of the smell of the cement, however, they would not instill the cement. That was the sham procedure. So what were the strengths of both the trials? They were high quality studies, uh, robust outcome measures were uh, there and robust statistical methods were used. The Calvis trial was a multi-center st uh, study with several countries involved. Um, and the Butch Panda trial exposed the financial advantages of performing vertebroplasty with advantages in reimbursement and how vertebroplasty had uh, uh, skyrocketed in the in the few years. However, these studies also had their downsides. Uh, there were definitely something fishy in both these trials, and it was uh, brought to light by William A. Clark in his uh, article in the Medical Journal of Australia. To know what was wrong in these studies, uh, first we, want, we need to know what is the basics of vertebroplasty. So, uh, vertebroplasty is done in patients who had who have an osteoporotic compression vertebral fractures uh, with a duration of less than six weeks uh, and who have the most severe pain. And what does vertebral plasty actually do? It provides internal fixation one, and it causes thermal and chemical destruction of the nerve endings two. So the first issue with the study was incorrect timing of vertebral plasty. So if vertebral plasty was to be equated with plastering of a distal and radius fracture, it would be absurd to apply a plaster at 9.5 weeks or 16 weeks. Now, what are these 9.5 and 16 weeks? These were the time duration, the mean duration of fractures when a procedure was performed in both the RCTs respectively. The average duration of healing in a vertebral fracture is three weeks. So this timeline was majorly flawed. Uh, and it suggested that the fractures had already healed. 
The next was inappropriate patient selection. The patient group with acute fractures of less than six weeks were only 32% of the total in the Butch Binder trial, and Calvis et al. had not even dislocated, disclosed this number. However, <clears throat> this number was definitely low as they excluded patients with fractures of less than four weeks. The interventional radiologist was excluded from the trial, which would have had compromised the clinical aspect of patient selection. <clears throat> Neither an MRI nor a bone scan was required in the Calvis trial. Patient recruitment problems. Uh, Calvis trial aimed to enroll 250 patients, but concluded this study with only 131 patients in four years. Which point did trial aim at uh, 200 patients, but recruited only 78 in 44.4 years? Almost 70% of them refused. So this may have caused selection bias. Close to 70% of patients came from a single center, making the Bujbander trial actually more of a single center, single radiology study. And in the Calmis trial, uh, almost 30 patients uh, from the control group crossed over to the vertebroplasty group due to persistent symptoms. Uh, in contrast, only eight patients who crossed over from the vertebroplasty group <clears throat> for their symptoms. The patient outcomes. Both RCT showed very poor efficacy. And only pain reductions was 2.3 in Bujbander and 3 in Calmis on the VAS scale. However, actually, uh, the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis show evidence that uh, the short-term mean reduction in pain can be up to 5.7 on the VAS uh, scale. <clears throat> There were deficiencies in the vertebroplasty technique in these uh, trials. Bujbander used a 13 kg needle and one ml series to inject cement. Average cement injected was 2.8 ml, but actually we And Clark et al. in their study used 11 gauge needle and needed up to 10 ml of cement in lumbar fractures. Then came the studies from the team batting for vertical plasty. The first study was from the Clarkson et al. in 2010. That was a vertical plasty trial. It was an open label prospective randomized trial from radiology departments of six hospitals in Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, patients 50 years and older with fracture of less than six weeks and VAS of five or more were used. Primary outcome was VAS. They showed that vertical plasty significantly fared better. <laughs> Then came the Vapor trial. It was a multi-center randomized double-blinded placebo control. It was by Clark et al. Uh, patients with one or two uh, fractures of less than six weeks duration, pain scale, uh, pain seven on ten were recruited. Sixty-one were vertical plasty, fifty-nine were placebo group. Uh, primary outcome measures were pain at three days, two weeks, one month, three months, six months. And there was mean reduction in pain in vertical plasty group. Was significantly greater than the control group. Now, uh, now what was different in this study? The blinding process in this study was highly efficient. Patients who were above 60 and had pain of more than seven only were included. This was significant as this is the very patient group which required vertical plasty. The placebo procedure included only local anesthesia to the subcutaneous tissue, not the periosteal region. The study was limited. However, in fact, that even though being a multi-center, it was mainly a single institute study. Other limitation was uh, it was the statistical methods were not as good as the Bruch point or the Calmis trials. There was one more study where vertical plasty uh, was uh, done versus conservative treatment. It was uh, uh, compared. Uh, even this showed that vertical plasty had uh, much greater pain relief and showed fewer complications when compared to conservative treatment. Then. to land a final blow to the people batting for vertical plasty which binder came out with the mother of all studies that is the cochrane vertical plasty review there were 21 rcts which were included five compared vertical plasty with placebo eight compared vertical plasty with usual care seven with kyphoplasty and one with facet joint injection now this review had high to moderate quality of evidence from five trials indicated that vertical plasty does not provide any clinically important benefit with respect to pain the review does Not support the role of vertical plasty for treating acute or subacute osteoporotic vertebral fractures, <clears throat> and the duration of pain was, uh, if it is less than six weeks, more than six weeks, has no clinically demonstrable benefit. Now this was huge. However, such a huge study had its limitations, and Clark et al. came out with the limitations. They highlighted it. They told that the review ignored the positive outcomes of Vapor trial. Vapor was the trial. Which adopted a different clinical approach to other blinded trials, rather than waiting for the pain to abate before vertical plasty. But they went ahead. They went in early uh, in the patients whose pain remained severe despite the use of opiate analgesia. Other blinded trials enrolled younger patients, lesser comorbidities. They were not even hospitalized actually. Vapor performed vertical plasty earlier than other trials. The mean fracture duration at the time of vertical plasty in vapor was 2.8 weeks, whereas in Bachbender and Calmes it was 12 and 23 weeks. There was a huge difference. There was a huge difference in the amount of cement instilled. Uh, vapor trial was a mean of 7.5 mL, whereas in Calmes and Bujman it was uh, roughly 2.5 mL. 
And the other limitations was that actual protocol in a Cochrane multiple bus reuse case that the study which are homogeneous are selected, whereas studies which are heterogeneous are not combined for analysis and they will be individually dis described. And vapor, ha vapor trial had important clinical and technical differences. Even then, it was included in the study and it was combined and this breached protocol. Uh, the trial include all of Virtus4 patients in subgroups of less than six weeks. However, half of them had fractures which were more than six weeks duration. Uh, this rendered the analysis nonsense. And these are the terms written by William Clark. <laughs> and there was huge conflict of interest. Uh, there is an ongoing war between the CVR authors and the vapor authors, as we see. Cochrane does not have any non-financial conflict of interest policy. The author group of CVR includes first authors of two key trials which are included in the study and one of whom is the coordinating editor of the Cochrane musculoskeletal section of uh, charged with editing the CVR. When you see such glaring inefficiencies in the trial, you actually sit and ponder, is this trial for true, uh, for real? Then came the real Kahani Metwis, that is, the, the, there was a complete U-turn. The, the, the team which was batting for vertebroplasty came with the Vertos 4 trial. <clears throat> it improved on the limitations of Vertos 2 trial. It was a double-blinded, randomized control study. Uh, 180 participants were randomized with, into vertebroplasty and the placebo procedure. Primary outcome was a reduction in VAS at one day, one week, one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. And this showed that vertebroplasty had no statistically significant pain relief or improvements and compared to the placebo procedure during the 12 month follow. This was a shock. So what uh, then this we reviewed the article more and then we came to know that this study when it was compared to vapor trial had one important difference. The vapor trial gave uh, local anesthesia the placebo subcutaneously. What as four trial gave it periosteally. This suggests a greater placebo effect in the what as four trial. Periosteal infiltration using a local anesthetic actually might have a treatment effect and this could perhaps partially explain the observed difference in response of the sham procedure. The results suggested that periosteal infiltration alone in early phase may provide enough pain relief with no need for additional cementation. <clears throat> However, despite the outcome of this trial, the authors still continue to offer vertebral plasty to a proportion of effort patients. They still believe that a place for vertebral plasty when efficacy outweighs the risk. So what can we do? So a future therapeutic pain strategy could be a combined regimen of periosteal infiltration and if this doesn't work. I mean, if the pain still is present, then you can give an, uh, additional cementation, uh, which is indi which may be indicated only a select subgroup of patients with insufficient pain relief. This is some food for thought. So I leave you all with this slide uh, of Rachel Buchbinder, who actually started this entire war. And uh, just food for thought. Just have a look at this slide. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, basically, this particular uh, uh, conclusion basically shakes our confidence in what we have been doing for all these years. We've been doing vertebroplasty right, left, and center. So if you go through this, if you went carefully through this presentation, it really teases you your, uh, uh, you know, your decision making uh, with regards to vertebroplasty in osteoporotic compression fractures, uh, whether what you, you did and what you're doing in terms of uh, augmenting it, is it, uh, uh, you know, is it a state of art? Is it right? Manish, do you have anything to say? Uh, sir, uh, very interesting uh, sequence of events uh, that is going on. Uh, it's very funny to see non-spine uh, surgeons, non-orthopedic uh, surgeons uh, treating uh, uh, spine fractures. And especially in days today where uh, even pain management guys and radiologists are treating spine. So uh, this is for with us to stay. And uh, uh, ultimately, it's the patient's verdict which plays. And you, I'm sure everybody in our practice gets patients from uh, previously treated patients where they got better immediately within uh, an hour or two. So that is going to stay. Uh, with respect to the quality of the studies, uh, it is clearly, again, as I said, the indications are wrong. The, the whole research question is wrong. Uh, so the study is bound to have, uh, you know, kind of haywire uh, results. So 
that would be my take on it sir. yeah a, a, a very interesting uh, compilation of uh, studies by tushar uh, what i found uh, interesting was they are actually giving weightage to uh, uh, to infiltration with the local anesthetic subperiodontally and that giving lasting uh, pain relief and contributing to uh, pain relief and uh, healing i don't know that's that's something which i would like to know more in detail Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Doctor Arvin? I mean, yeah. I think uh, see, this this group, this the last paper was by the same group which published after this Buchbinder study and Kam study came up. So they were they were actually proponents of vertebroplasty who turned around in the last paper based on their own evidence. So there is mm. definitely some food for thought, uh, you know. Uh, so I totally don't agree with Manish because the same group uh, which was. proposing whatever plus initially yeah Now, the thing is, is the, the problem here is uh, in all of this is case selection see it's the the natural history of vertebral compression fractures is similar to uh, most of the conservatively treated conditions like disc herniation see initially you know it is uh, bold from the blue and gradually over a period of time the pain subsides in the disc herniation or in uh, you know osteoporotic compression fractures so when you Select to do this particular procedure. That is that is the time you have to compare, uh, you know, one uh, treatment versus the against. Because at the end of six to eight months, they all recover. And if your majority of your patients are belong to that later uh, the delayed group, what may be happening is there is some local kyphosis causing uh, you know a stress on the facet joints posteriorly. There is segmental kyphosis. So when you inject uh, local anesthetic, you know, around the facet joint. you may be probably giving you know relief uh, of facet pain in in those delayed cases so that's why when you compare pain uh, scores it is almost the so same as a middle path would you want to do more frequent x rays and see if it's collapsing and then intervene at some point or would you just we still go by clinical clinical we still go by clinical evaluation so x rays yeah. i don't think how much they help okay yeah. uh, right. you are thought of that on clinic Can I interfere? Yeah, Dr. Arvind. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. See, our indications are very straightforward. Patient is coming back to you with increasing pain. X-ray documenting that he is worsening, and kyphosis is also worsening. And then that is an indication for us to stabilize. If they are healing on their own, we just monitor them and treat them with anti-osteoporotic treatment. But Bhavi, these are the patients where they are giving facet blocks and you know. Yeah. so i had one study uh, done for first 300 cases of vertebroplasty without uh, facet block and once i got there is one russian literature that professor i met and they said that they are uh, that's compare like a sham study they are doing facet joint injections so what i used to do in next 400 cases is along with the vertebroplasty subperiosteal infiltration along with facet block and that has improved my results wherever we did in the, in the indicated cases and patient has substantial uh, uh, pain free period even if their analgesic requirement is hardly a dose of paracetamol in a 24 hours i think that is because of the local kyphosis which occurs and that causes rubbing of the facet joint causing facet pain so okay. it so i have modified my vertebroplasty procedure in that way that i am infiltrating up to the superiorsteal region and also i am simultaneously i am injecting the facet joints also before passing the needle yeah there is a lot of technical discussion why don't we go into the um, uh, techniques uh, individually kyphoplasty we've heard of uh, heard already let's go to the next talk uh, vertebroplasty by dr manish kotari dr manish kotari Uh, paucity of time uh, let's try and uh, stick to the uh, to 10 minutes of uh, presentation and 2 uh, to 5 minutes of discussion thank you yeah is my screen visible hello yes thanks right, uh, thank yeah. you uh, yeah. thank you uh, for this yeah, opportunity uh, i am dr manish kothari i'll be speaking on vertebroplasty so uh, what are the goals of vertebroplasty we've seen through dr simesin has beautifully described them uh, so what i see it as uh, there should be an adequate cement fill it should have no complications 
and uh, the procedure itself it's a pain procedure so it should itself work as a uh, pain procedure and you should not cause more pain causing the, uh, during the vertebroplasty so these are the requirements uh, that you will need nowadays in market as a you get different varieties of vertebroplasty cement uh, many a times i still use uh, the basic simple uh, 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 the cement where i mix barium sulfate additionally which is highly cost effective uh most important is uh, that before you start a vertebroplasty uh, you have to keep uh, the ot absolutely cold these are the basic principles of any cementing and keep the cement in the fridge uh, uh very thing uh, one thing i'm very particular about to all my ot staff is that before you take the patient on the table your entire ot setup should be ready including uh, uh, your scrub nurse who should be ready with the trolley she should not make the trolley after the patient is positioned so uh, these are the basic uh, requirements you need 1 cc syringes you can either use a lure lock 1 cc i use only 1 cc syringes i don't use 2 cc or 5 cc uh, syringes uh, other is the uh, the jamshedi needle uh, i prefer to use a cook needle with a, a diamond tip uh, there are other bevel shaped ones available uh, but they kind of sometimes they slip along the facet when you're trying to take the entry point so i i uh, prefer the diamond tip uh, cook needle which is very sharp and very easy to position local anesthetic we are all aware of one particular thing that i have now started doing is i use soda bicarb in my uh, local anesthetic and this reduces the pain of uh, local anesthetic injection mind you many times patient winces with pain when you are injecting lignocaine and if you add this soda bicarb it just takes that pain away completely and your onset of action is very quick uh of course protect yourself and protect your staff uh now uh, you connect the basic uh, uh 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 monitors to the patient i try to finish my vertebroplasty purely under local anesthesia probably two out of three times i get away with only local anesthesia not even sedation one in three and the rest of the times probably i'll use sedation as well uh you make the patient comfortable and uh uh, uh use pillows i don't use bolsters i use pillows uh, for comfort Uh, uh next you want to square the vertebra uh, this is before you start the procedure so you want to make sure that your end plates are seen many times if you have a end plate fracture which is quite common uh, you may not see a proper parallel end plate then you can use your upper and lower vertebral end plate as a reference points uh, to square the vertebra make sure that your spinous process is in the middle so you have an absolutely square uh, pedicles then Uh, uh to square the vertebra you may have to do adjustments so i uh, i uh, always use adjustments on the table to square the vertebra rather than using the uh, c arm to square the vertebra so i try to keep my c arm as dead straight as possible because it saves time saves a number of radiation your uh, technician does not have to reposition the c arm every time he is uh, taking shots next is uh, the local anesthetic uh, so as uh, we were talking about so i just give uh, anesthetic one in the direction of the needle uh, so i even when i insert the first subcutaneous needle uh, it is under c arm where it is goes in the direction of uh, the proposed trajectory of the needle next i take a spinal needle and i go all the way to the facet joint at the entry of my uh, uh, needle so what we were discussing previously about facet joints and uh, periosteal injections this is a standard uh, uh, routine practice for me and i go all the way down next is uh, 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 again you check the entry of the uh, needle under c arm and in the same trajectory as what you have uh, proposed uh, uh, trajectory and you've already injected your local anesthetic uh then comes the landing so uh, the landing is roughly on the left side it will be at around 9 or 11 o'clock on the right side it is around 1 to 3 o'clock and that's where you land your needles uh in this case you've seen they've been docked at the proposed uh, uh site you always check uh, your entry on the lateral uh, image also uh, you want to be on the upper half of the pedicle depending on where the fracture is Uh, this is slightly different in a kyphoplasty where you go uh, about half a centimeter under uh, the fracture in vertoplasty i try to target the fracture you make sure that the needle goes towards the fracture rather than away from the fracture uh, now very important step is uh, traversing the pedicle now uh, these are very simple concepts that you need to understand so in this case uh, if you see that the needle is already crossing the medial pedicle border but on the lateral you have not even reached the posterior uh, cortex 
then you are definitely inside the canal as you can see in this uh, uh, animation next if you are uh, on the ap if you are on the outer half of the pedicle and on the lateral you are much away much ahead of the posterior cortex you are probably outside uh, the vertebral body and this is what you have to avoid to have a perfect trajectory uh, you should be inside the pedicle uh, between the medial and lateral and while you have crossed the posterior uh, cortex so you are completely inside uh, the pedicle and you reach the anterior uh, half of the uh, vertebral body so in this case i uh, that you can see this this area is the fracture i am slightly under the fracture and i sometimes when i am in doubt i use a uh, omnipack die and in you can see that uh, the die is not filling up the fracture it's probably a venogram of uh, the uh, the batson's venous plexus as uh, dr sumit had said earlier uh, that uh, uh, the the most of the vessels are in the posterior half then i uh, uh, reposition the needles go into the fracture this is a die injection and it has entered the fracture so i am in a satisfactory position and i can start my cementing now i'm going to show you uh, what cement i use so this is a very simple cement very cheap and economical and we use a eto barium sulfate <coughs> uh, uh, this has been now freshly ordered from the uh, fridge uh, this is a small video of uh, the cement mixing we are all well versed with cement mixing so you mix the powder and uh, the barium sulfate you degranulate the barium sulfate because they can get clumpy you don't want to make sure it is properly powder you take a, a part of uh, about half teaspoon of uh, cement uh, the polymer out and you take the equal amount of barium sulfate and you mix it in uh, the powder and then you mix your monomer you start mixing and you don't beat it too uh, hard you just go very gentle uh, mixing of the cement and you fill it in a 20 cc syringe i use a 1 cc syringe in front of it so there's no spill and uh, you fill around 7 to 8 depending on the number of levels you are doing and your white spill now next come is the consistency this is one thing that you all have to be very clear about uh, you it's a toothpaste consistency as a toothpaste comes out of uh, say a colgate toothpaste comes out of the uh, tube this is how the cement should be i'll play it again it should be of toothpaste consistency and it should not be liquid it should not be dripping down uh, to avoid any uh, uh, unnecessary effects uh, during the cementing now comes uh, uh, the cementing part this is a quick video of the passing of needles uh, you can see that i've uh, filled in the die this is the die coming in and that's a, a good position that i will flush it out with a saline this is a case of uh, kumel's lesion with a, a, a upper half a cleft this is a gradual filling of the cement this is under continuous observation and i come gradually uh, to the uh, uh, posterior Uh, rather middle half of the vertebral body so you have a good film uh, once the cementing is done you wait for the cement uh, to uh, uh, set outside and then you remove the needle gradually in a rotatory uh, movement and uh, if uh, and if you have, uh, many times as you can get away with a totally uh, uh, under a local anesthesia you can get the patient to mobilize in the ot itself so talk about early mobilization uh, well that's it and uh, talking about uh, there's a very common controversy is uh, kyphoplasty versus vertebroplasty so most of the uh, uh, the meta analysis uh, and you can uh, see of the papers uh, there is not much difference uh, in clinical results between kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty the height regain that you get from kyphoplasty is highly overrated uh, you don't uh, the difference is hardly probably a millimeter or so which uh, doesn't make any clinical difference and the cost is exorbitantly high so i most of the times i do vertebroplasty is only in the tumor cases that i may consider doing a kyphoplasty thank you thank you thank you very much manish for the crisp presentation uh if you don't mind we'll keep your questions for the last part yeah. just before the guest lecture for want of time i now request uh, dr arvin bhave to speak on vessel plasty over to you dr arvin bhave yeah good morning uh good morning please proceed yeah yeah
Yeah, actually, most of my part has been done by. Uh, is it getting shared? Hello. No, 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 not yet. No, not yet being shared. Not yet. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, we had kept it ready before. Uh, Amrit, maybe you can take questions till Dr. Arvind Bhavai sets up. Yeah, I guess so. So, uh, Dr. Manish, I mean, uh, there may be some patients uh, who uh, you feel are uh, not amicable for uh, uh, for uh, local anesthesia. So, would you uh, have you tried spinal epidural anesthesia as a? Can you see now? Yeah, this screen. Yeah, we can see the screen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, please proceed with your uh, presentation. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so far we are having very good uh, uh, presentations for from all our previous speakers. And all of us are going to face this problem of rising age and hence more degenerative disease. Uh, so this is what it is going to be the future of mankind because all of us are going to survive till 70s or 80s or even more longer. Dr. Bhave, you still have to open your presentation. Exactly. Double click. Uh, New share. Should I go one minute? I will just. It is not coming. I don't know. Uh, we can see your screen, but not the. You have to click on the part, PPT. Mm. Yeah, I had clicked one minute. Nisa. And now what do I do? You. You open the presentation and just share it. Yeah. I opened the presentation yeah. and screen share. Yeah. Maximize it and screen share. Is it opening? Yeah. Okay. Huh? Yeah. So as uh, we have a vertebral compression fracture, we have downtrend leading to spinal deformity, decreased lung capacity, impaired function, finally leading into 23% of increased mortality. And this is the crux of all the problem where we need to uh, think of treating the osteoporotic fractures. This is a very well documented presentation by Lieberman and published in Spine 2001. These are the two X-rays subsequent, uh, done, subsequently done in four days' time, and which shows that there is further collapse of apparently a stable vertebral fracture. And hence, there is a, a, a thinking that we should try and stabilize this particular vertebral uh, injuries so that deformity is less and disability, and finally the reduction of the mortality. And hence, we want to cut the downward spiral in, uh, to improve the quality of life and correction of deformity using minimally invasive techniques. So what are the issues of vertebral augmentation? Single foremost important issue is to prevent the cement leakage. So safety is the biggest challenge on all these procedures. Second is, if possible, correct the height so as to reduce the kyphosis and make it more neutral and provide interdigitation inter effect so that the marrow and the foreign material or bone filler material what you are using, they hold each other so that there is no further displacement. Uh, so there is whole gamut of uh, uh, percutaneous treatments which have been developed with, uh, as already said, index treatment being the vertebroplasty where we don't create vertebral, uh, we don't restore the height, neither we create the void. Then came uh, another thinking that we should try and correct the height of the uh, vertebral body so as to correct the kyphosis. Like we do all reductions of the fractures and then fix it. We don't accept malunion. So similar was the ideology. And initially the kyphoplasty came using mechanical pressure and then the famous uh, kyphoplasty which uses hydrostatic pressure. Today I'm going to uh, put forward another modality of uh, treatment where we don't create a void, but we use hydrostatic pressure of the bone filler material itself, and that is termed as vessel plasty, which has tried to answer few of the problems what we face during vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. So vessel plasty is a new term. It is a non-fusion technique using an implant body expander. Currently, this vessel X container system, which I have worked with Professor Darvano, who is the initiator of this particular uh, 
implant and i had opportunity to work with him for last 13 years right since the idea animal experiments uh, human trials and eu and uh, us fda certification so this is a system which is supposed to be a better system because it has got more safety margins i will just in brief uh, tell you what is the peculiarity of this it contains a pet non stretchable container which tries to prevent the leakage of the bone filler material or the cement it has got 100 micron pores which provide interdigitation of this material with the bone marrow and hence stabilization of the uh, material is improved and hence final results are also improved and this is a fine implant broad body expanders which also tries to restore the vertebral height and hence having some correction of the kyphotic deformity which occurs due to osteoporotic fractures so this is in short about this particular implant in the we inject it in a deflated condition and once we start injecting the material it goes on inflating on its own because of the pressure atmospheric we take advantage of physics that is atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere what everybody of us have in our operating rooms so it works in three ways it has a pressure to lift inside the vertebra so you are lifting the inflates from inside same uh, philosophy what we tried in kyphoplasty then interdigitation effect this as you see in osteoporosis there are a lot of uh, spaces and there is few lamellae so our bone filler material has to slowly integrate with this particular lamina and the bone tissue in order to fill the void and hence have good interdigitation giving you more stability than other modalities of treatment as how we have developed because we started with the index procedure of vertebroplasty which was a minimally invasive treatment done under local it instantly relieves the pain but it had also its shortcomings like main problem is leakage of the cementing material also it does not restore the vertebral height and does not create the void so minimum amount of cement is sufficient to stabilize the fracture and that is how it is supposed to reduce the pain then came uh, the next was kyphoplasty where the thinking was to increase the height in put more cementing material but this is a this is not an implant so anyhow you have to remove this implant and create a bigger void than what you do during vertebroplasty and cement goes very easily in the void so created and many times you don't have control over the expansion so the water balloon it expands on its own and once you deflate that balloon because it is not an implant you have to remove that balloon and then what you are going to do is vertebroplasty in the void so created only advantage is you have had some uh, achieve some gain in height some bigger void uh, created and hence you can feel more bone filler material currently we are using bone cement but now we are using biodegradable cements also for younger patients so the basic differences in uh, vessel plasty and balloon kyphoplasty the basic is a material second is a porosity in uh, balloon you don't have porous because it contains all contrast agent and uh, uh, saline it is designed uh, vessel x is designed for viscous bone materials so you can put uh, other bone filler materials like anti malignancy agents you can use other modalities you can use uh, bioabsorbable cements with this which is not done which may not be possible wholly with the uh, balloon alone this is a biocompatible material made up of pet so similar to vicryl what we are using in our day to day practice this is more non absorbable material of vicryl and hence you don't require removal so it is a permanent implant which can sit in the body and it is a biocompatible as against in balloon it collapses uh, you, you have to collapse it remove it and then do your routine vertebroplasty what happens inside the bone what is the difference between the two the container size and shape is defined we have different sizes of implants vessels available depending on bony morphology of the vertebral body then end procedure is justified then how much you are injecting is also controllable if you feel that it is leaking then you can always stop without having any problem but in kyphoplasty once you inject it up appears like it is similar to vertebroplasty and then you have no control over the cement which you have injected and then height restoration is unpredictable as dr sumit sinha had already told early fractures you get better reduction but as uh, fracture starts consolidating 
you may not have a good correction and only less uh, cement goes in a less pressurized or less uh, uh, resistant areas and hence irregular filling can occur as against as you see on the screen vessel plasty has got a uniform uh, dimensions fixed dimensions defined and hence you are you are getting relatively a stable predictable uh, expansion of the vertebral body and hence the results there are differences this is an example what you uh, fracture compression fracture treated by vessel plasty you can see the implant inside this is a post operative ct and you can see how much interdigitation you allow that all depends on what you see on the cm so you can also end up injecting more cement if you want so far as you are not causing any neuro deficit but you can restrict also which i can show you in future cases when i am presenting this in balloon you have no control over the exact size how much it is going to expand it expands on its own that is the main difference and hence that is the difference in the results what you are likely to get and then we have these difficult situations where vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty cannot work like in this patient these patients which had got ca stomach rise operated secondaries causing cord compression this is a vascular necrosis with combination this is also re renal secondaries where patient was paraplegic and this is a 20% heart working where a burst fracture posteriorly so in this situation definitely you cannot go with vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty and you still want to do a minimally invasive procedure under local anesthesia because these are not good cases to undergo general anesthesia so question of putting minimally invasive or percutaneous screw also doesn't arise in this particular situation so this is one of the cases 82 years old medical practitioner two months ago treated conservatively went into a vascular necrosis these are his uh, images ct and mri you can see he is bedridden so you have to treat him otherwise fit he was a medical practitioner physician so vessel plasty is done everything under local anesthesia you can see the correction what we got the implant uh, inserted cement getting injected the final position of the implant and this is a follow up x ray post op x ray you can see good reduction of the uh, improvement in the height and good stabilization of the uh, vertebral lesion that is uh, cumulus lesion what he had pre operatively and he walked on the same day which he had not done for last two months there is another lady you can see uh, burst fracture l1 uh, eight weeks fracture uh, bedridden not able to move not even to do her and her all sons were in uh, foreign countries so nobody to help her at home so at this point we have treated her with uh, vessel plasty and these are her uh, post op x rays eight weeks dynamic x rays you see good alignment no future collapse and this is her clinical uh, you can see you hardly can find out any wound here and it is walking you cannot see any kyphosis so this is the end result of this procedure so in short this is a, a video this uh, mri now cm pictures inserting the needle creating a void by a small drill uh, ap view and then we have devised this locally this instrument which also can create some void additionally if you want and then vessel is inserted in a close position confirm position now we remove the guide wire this is an implant exactly under the collapse and now we start injecting the bone material or the cement and you can see the end plate is getting elevated so this is ap and lateral view and this is a final picture where you can see you can have controlled expansion of this uh, particular implant and an interdigitation of the cement occurs so to conclude the this there is good increase in height of the vertebral bodies all the patients were pain free and started to do their activities of daily living right from next day then improvement in vas and other disability scores fully done under local anesthesia so no ga and it is only a small wound stitchless surgery mobilized on the same day and they are discharged with bandage dressing hence to summarize about vessel plasty it is another non fusion technique apparently a third generation now of kyphoplasty to restore the height cement is inside the non stretchable container which tries to prevent the leakage of the cement material 
and this controllable vertebroplasty. So you can inject whatever you feel safe. So it is a controllable uh, injection of the cement and it provides interdigitations and makes your implant and the vertebral body more stable. I thank you everyone, all MISAB uh, uh, team to give, give me uh, okay, uh, to give me a chance to present my work, which we have done with Professor Darbono in development of this uh, particular implant. Uh, I thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bave. Now uh, we would have loved to discuss it right away, but uh, yeah. we'll wait for a while. Uh, let's go to the next uh, speaker. That is. Uh, yeah, uh, on instrumented fusions by Dr. Abhijit Pawar. Dr. Abhijit Pawar, over to you. Thank uh, you. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to talk about instrumented fusion in osteoporotic vertebral fractures uh, and when there's neurological involvement, uh, when the patient progresses to the next level. So what are the risk factors uh, where the patient can progress to neuro deficit. So these are the, some list fractures from the literature. Um, we have compiled it here. So incomplete burst fracture when there is middle column involvement, there's a vacuum sign, local kyphosis, uh, progressive kyphosis of more than 20 degrees, retropulsion with spinal canal encroachment of more than 25%. Also, if there is a posterior ligamentous injury, tricolumn injury, then these patients are, are at a risk of progression of kyphosis and retropulsion. And patients uh, who have multiple wedge compression fractures, they tend to progress faster and lead to neurological involvement. So what are the indications for fusion and stabilization in vertebral compression fractures? Basically, when the conservative management fails with patients having some of these risk factors and this progressive worsening of pain and deformity, and, and also this worsening of neurology on conservative management. So a lot of these patients uh, are elderly. They do not heal well. Uh, on conservative management and they have either of these risk factors present and they progress to neurological deficits and they become non-ambulatory because of pain. So these are the indications where not only vertebroplasty uh, will not work because there is uh, they are non-ambulatory because of weakness. So in these patients, what are the surgical options? There's a lot of literature present on the internet and they can be treated by either an anterior posterior combined surgery, that is a 360 degree fusion, uh, anterior cage and posterior stabilization. Uh, they can also be treated by posterior decompression and fusion. Otherwise, you can do posterior stabilization and fusion without decompression. There's literature to support that as well. Vertebroplasty and percutaneous and minimal invasive stabilization and cement augmented uh, fenestrated percutaneous stabilization and vertebroplasty. So there are the various techniques. Now we will shortly discuss which technique to use when. So there are several papers published, but for osteoporotic vertebral body fractures at the thoracolumbar lumbar spine, the indication for a 360 stabilization is, is when there is a posterior cortex involvement, when there is more than 70 to 80% collapse of the vertebral body, along with neuro deficit and a kyphotic malalignment of more than 20 degrees. So basically a elderly patient with neuro deficit and more than 80% collapse and kyphosis is an indication for a 360 stabilization. That is anterior uh, cage and posterior stabilization. We come to one case example. She's a 73 year old female with deep D12 osteoporotic fracture with dynamic instability. You can see this is a supine X-ray and this is a sitting X-ray. So this is al almost a vertebra plana. Uh, there's a vacuum sign seen here on the AP view. Um, and that's the MRI here also showing. But on a sitting film, it's almost a vertebral plana with instability, focal kyphosis of more than 30 degrees, and it's more than even 70, 80% collapse. So these patients, if you just do vertebral plasty, it will not work. The patient's neurology, patient has a paraparesis. So you need to do a decompression and remove the mechanical compression. So this is what we did in this patient. Uh, we did a posterior decompression and uh, anterior fusion was attempted uh, with a mesh cage. The anterior support should be given in patients with, in addition to posterior fusion in these patients to reduce the post operative mechanical failures. Um, so this is little aggressive procedure, but it ensures that you correct the kyphosis and 
uh, you get realignment as well as there is fusion. So the screws don't back out or they don't become loose at follow up. Next second patient, uh, this is a D12 osteoporotic fracture, more than 60-70% uh, collapse. This is angular kyphosis of more than 30 degrees. Uh, there is a conus compression. So this patient also treated by same technique, posterior decompression, uh, anterior support with mesh cage, and, and posterior two levels above and two levels below stabilization. What I do is when I place this mesh cage, I do a, a hemilaminate tummy on one side only, remove the parts and the pedicle on one side. Do not touch the lamina on the other side. So you don't destabilize the spine completely and put the cage only from one side. So you see this cage is slightly more on the left side here as compared to that in the center because we have not removed the lamina here and we have not removed the structures here. Only the pars and the pedicle on one side was removed. So you don't destabilize it more and the patients do well. They heal well, the neurology improves. And the good part is since there is fusion, there is no loosening of implant at follow-up and there is no loss of correction. So these are candidates for 360 fusion. Another patient, 73, 70 year old female, L3 osteoporotic fracture. You see there is a dynamic instability, almost a vertebral plana, uh, and there is a neuro deficit. So in this patients, you cannot do a kyphoplasty, you cannot do vertebral plasty because there's complete collapse, almost a vertebral plana. Um, so what you I did is we went and did a vertebral column resection, uh, anterior column section and put a mesh cage uh, on one side. And since you have good anterior structural support, you can get away with the short segment fixation. In the dorsal lumbar junction, usually I prefer two levels above, two levels below, because as a junctional area, the stress levels are high. So you need to go two levels above, two levels below. If it's, this is L3 level, here, if you put a structural uh, mesh cage and a, and a bone graft, you can get away with a short segment fixation. And, and if it, and it fuses, and there is no loosening of implants or uh, loss of correction at follow-up. But there are certain limitations of these procedures, uh, of these posterior procedures and 360 uh, reconstruction. There is a risk of neural tissue damage, such as neural tear, spinal cord kinking due to shortening of spinal canal. In, in severely osteoporotic patients, there is poor strength of implant fixation. And yes, there is a screw, risk of screws getting loose. So that is one risk. Laminate tummy and resection of all posterior lateral components, including the pedicle, may highly destabilize the spinal column in the unstable condition. That's why, as I told you, I tend to remove only the hemilamina on one side and the pedicle on one side. So we don't destabilize the spine too much. And also this, this procedure has limitations in patients with medical comorbidities. If patient is elderly, having diabetes, renal disease, or uh, advanced uh, heart disease, then these patients are uh, morbid. These procedures are morbid procedures for them. So you need to use with caution in these patients. So what is the option in this patient? What are the other options? There was one, this article published in Journal, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine by Yukita and Baba. So they compared vertebroplasty augmented short segments posterior fixation uh, with neurodeficits in thoracic lumbar spine with posterior surgery without vertebroplasty uh, combined with anterior stabilization. And they concluded that the combination of posterior stabilization and anterior interosseous support, uh, vertebra, that is a vertebral plasty, acts as, a, acts as good as a 360 stabilization. So it gives the equal same stability as a um, anterior cage. And it can be performed by a minimal invasive posterior approach where you put the screws by a minimal invasive uh, percutaneous technique and you do the uh, good structural support by vertebral plasty. So, they achieved anatomic reduction successfully uh, by patient positioning on, on the bolsters and sag of the fractured vertebral body. In their paper, there was no difference in reduction loss between patients with unstable osteoporotic vertebral fractures treated by anterior posterior approach uh, with anterior cage implantation versus the hybrid stabilization where they used posterior stabilization and, and vertebral plasty. So elderly patients with, with comorbidities and extensive osteoporosis can be treated by hybrid technique. So some of those cases, uh, she's a 78 year old female wheelchair bound Asia C neurology. She has multiple uh, risk signs, uh, vacuum sign, local kyphosis of more than 24 degrees, anterior vertebral body height loss of more than, it's more than even 60, 70%, retropulsion and, and you see this canal encroachment. 
So this patient, since she was 78 year old, she had a very high osteoporosis. So we use fenestrated uh, screws, uh, minimal invasive screws, cement with cement augmentation. The advantage is you can get away with a short segment stabilization. Otherwise, you have to go two levels above and two levels below. And also a vertebral plastic at the same time. The patient did recover well and now she is ambulatory. She's almost one, more than one year follow-up and she is doing excellent without any loss of correction or loosening of implants. So in these elderly patients with comorbidities, this is an excellent technique and it provides the same stability as a 360 uh, stabilization um, by an open, open surgery. Again, this is an 82-year-old male patient, Asia D neurology, severe pain and wheelchair bound, a uh, lot of spine risk signs, vacuum sign, kyphosis more than 30 degrees, uh, loss of anterior vertebral body height loss, uh, about more than even 70% and spinal canal encroachment. 82 years old patients, uh, the, their risk of doing a morbid procedure with anterior and 360 reconstruction. So we did a vertebral plasty and minimal invasive stabilization. Within a couple of weeks, the patient was completely ambulatory and now he walks uh, without any support. And it's been almost one year. Uh, this patient is doing very well without any loss of correction um, or loosening of implants. Through this is another bur incomplete burst fracture in a 70-year-old male. He had a retropolitan canal encroachment. You see there's a burst fracture here and some neurological involvement was there. He underwent the same procedure, minimal invasive stabilization and vertebral plasty at D, uh, from DA to D10. And he's doing really well, uh, ambulating well with, uh, well with complete recovery in neurology. So this technique is an uh, excellent alternative uh, for a uh, 360 degree stabilization in elderly patients with comorbidities. So advantages is the vertebral plasty gives a good structural support in the anterior column, uh, not exactly like a cage, but it does more or less like a cage. And the fixation provides stabilization of the middle and the posterior columns. The correction of kyphosis and fairly good restoration of anterior vertebral body height res results in indirect decompression. And if you are still unhappy, you can still do a, a, a midline decompression with a small midline incision. So this patient, this patient, this procedure is well tolerated in elderly patients with uh, comorbidities. There's another paper published in European Spine Journal where they did the rapid just, capacity of time. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yes, so they just did the posterior instrument fusion without neural decompression, and they had good results. So this is a patient where we had done a, without any. Uh, we had just done minimal energy st stabilization with uh, percutaneous screws cement augmented screws and the patients did well. So the conclusion is patients below the age of 70 years without comorbidities with greater than 70 to 80% collapse, kyphosis and neuro deficits can be treated by anterior posterior approach of 360 stabilization. Elderly yeah. patients are treated with uh, mainly hybrid stabilization. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. Uh, the guest speaker has uh, expressed his wish to uh, do start off his presentation. So we will uh, request, uh, I hand it over to Dr. Arvind Kulkarni for uh, taking it forward for the guest lecture. And then we'll come back for the, for the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, so good morning everybody again. So we have a very prolific uh, speaker amongst us today, uh, Dr. Manoj Chadha, who is a very senior endocrinologist. He's at uh, Hinduja Hospital. He has his own uh, endocrine care center at uh, New Bombay. He's been a teacher uh, since long for DNB. He was at KM Hospital earlier and uh, as well as Nair Hospital earlier as a teacher. He also uh, presided over the Endocrine Society of India as the president. So he has a lot of uh, feathers in his cap and uh, treatment of osteoporotic compression fractures and osteoporosis itself is mostly 99% medical in nature uh, with interventions necessary only when it is really necessary. So without wasting any time, I'd like to uh, invite this uh, uh, great speaker uh, to uh, throw some light uh, on the state of art management of uh, osteoporosis and osteoporotic compression fractures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. Actually, I was quite enjoying myself. I felt like a spine surgeon also. <laughs> uh, I have a, another commitment at 11, so I didn't want to spoil the fun. Um, I'm going to share my uh, slides.
actually while uh, waiting for my uh, talk i have been cutting down on my slides so hopefully i should be able to finish in 10 12 minutes because i can see a lot of uh, questions that are likely to come up i i heard uh, dr ranji and dr kulkarni having a discussion on uh, about medical treatment options so uh, one of the things that was raised a couple of minutes ago was do we need to have a detail investigation for such patients or do we just go ahead and start medical treatment uh, i think what is important is to understand that a fragility fracture is a sign of osteoporosis and that this patient needs to be treated the question of doing investigations is to get number one the baseline state and number two is to rule out secondary causes of osteoporosis the green uh, causes are more often seen in women and it's about 30% cases of postmenopausal osteoporosis would be having secondary causes like overtreated hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism malabsorption disease celiac disease hyperparathyroidism whereas in men it could be up to 60% causes i mean as a student 30 odd years ago i was taught that men don't get osteoporosis and if you do see osteoporosis in men you please look for a secondary cause so hypogonadism is something which we see in our practice as endocrinologists uh glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis everyone would be seeing in the practice alcohol induced osteoporosis so alcohol and smoking are two very well known bone toxins and they can cause problems and then there's this whole list that you would get it in any textbook the evaluation as i said is standard uh, you must start with calcium phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase doing a pth and vitamin d also put optional as now more or less become uh, a routine in practice bone markers some of have not become very important because the results are not reliable things have improved with the automation but bone markers are not to be used for diagnosis they are used only for follow up of our patients uh, dexa tbs which is another uh, software on the dexa machine is a useful tool and frax is something what we have been trying to work to get indian data so that we can uh, instead of because the frax india that you see now is actually uh, indians in singapore so which is not really indian data so what we have been trying with uh, at hinduja hospital dr vikas agashe we have asked dr bijlani also to help us we have a fracture liaison service requesting all of you to inform one of us uh, in case there is a fragility fracture because we want to prevent a second fracture it's very very difficult to say that you can prevent osteoporosis although it is possible but you have to remember that one fragility fracture increases the risk of a subsequent fracture very significantly so a vertebral fracture the risk of a second vertebral fracture is about 4.4 times and 2.3 so although the title was compression fractures you have to remember that your patient is also likely to get a intertrochanteric hip fracture or a colis fracture uh two or three cases just to you know give you an idea how you could be going from uh, mild cases to severe cases i mean this is a uh, post menopausal lady 7 years t score of minus 2.8 at the spine and at the hip is minus 2.2 so just to you know sort of tell you that very often there is a concordance in uh, the bmd score within the spine and the hip but in the so called younger patients the spine gets affected first because of the lamellar bone and the cortical lamellar communication uh, combination in the hip gets affected slowly so immediate post op it's a more of a spine problem 65 plus it becomes more hip serious spine somehow gets ignored uh, certain basic investigations that you must do and you can see that most of it is normal now another lady uh, who scores actually by definition would go into osteopenia but not osteoporosis uh, bmi is normal but what is very significant is this hip fracture in the mother so a hip fracture in parents and especially in the mother is more or less suggested that this patient is going to go into osteoporosis so it's not probably as bad as fragility fracture but probably next to fragility fracture so you must keep that in mind so do we need to treat this or not we'll see at the end of the presentation 
however uh, this lady was not treated she was doing her regular exercise diet and uh, one day she slipped and she had a compression fracture was given calcium and vitamin d for 3 months and left alone now i'm sure you would object to my putting this up but this elite group may be very very you know uh, ready to start treatment for osteoporosis but i'm afraid uh, even in good centers like arts very often these patients don't get treated and then end up much later on with a fractured hip so that's the sad story uh, of uh, osteoporosis and like i said the sad story of missed opportunities to prevent a second fracture um so as they grow older i said they could be having uh, compression or no compression but age is a very important factor contributing to the risk of osteoporosis uh, so as a matter of fact if the bmd value of a 70 year old and a 50 year old were the same you would have to be very very careful while dealing with the 70 year old so when we are talking in terms of who should be considered for treatment please note most of the data the studies phase 3 for new medication is on post menopausal women and later on the men come into picture uh, whether it's 60 or even little lower but please remember in men if you are looking at osteoporosis you have to rule out secondary causes and a t score of minus 2.5 or less automatically becomes an indication but if you have one fragility factor with osteopenia that is also an indication for treatment and if you are used to using the frac score then a 10 year probability of hip fracture of more than 3% or a 10 year probability of a major uh, osteoporotic fracture of more than 20% becomes an indication i want to mention a term called as imminent fragility fracture uh, if you look at john kennes's data he talks of now uh, severe osteoporosis where there are two or more vertebral fractures or if there is one vertebral fracture with a t score of less than minus 3.5 those are severe osteoporosis and we would go in for aggressive treatment uh, but if it's less than that uh, minus 2.5 uh, with one fracture that also needs aggressive treatment but this new group of imminent high risk is something which is uh, getting a lot of uh, importance nowadays so i i mentioned about uh, most orthopedic surgeons uh, not treating osteoporosis as a serious problem they are all great when it comes to fixing the fracture now if you talk to a physician and he is handling a patient with heart attack they always get beta blockers and uh, hypertensive as follow therapy even and statins even if their cholesterol levels are normal but when you talk osteoporotic fragility fractures less than 15% this is data from canada we have done a similar study at hinduja hospital also and unfortunately the results were not different so we have to understand that a fracture is to osteoporosis what heart attack is to cardiovascular disease and as i said most physicians would treat a heart attack with statin aspirin uh, arbs so we need to get our uh, orthopedic surgeons to understand this and the importance of fracture license service again comes in here please understand we will not interfere with your treatment options the idea is only to see that the treatment is followed because there are studies which talk of compliance more than 50% drop their treatment by the end of one year most fragility fractures happen within the first two years of the first fracture and that's the period we should not miss out so i was talking about defining severe osteoporosis so these are the ones who probably will require anabolic therapy first and then followed by anti disruptive therapy we'll come to that in a moment so in terms of formic therapy uh, you're all familiar the anti disruptives and the anabolic agents i'm not talking of calcium and vitamin d here because those are considered as non pharmacological therapy just like exercise for the weight bearing exercise neurological strengthening of your spine uh, prevention of falls and etc so those are a separate lecture altogether so the anabolic agent which we have today only is teriparatide uh, that's a daily injection for 24 months and the results are very good the problem is again compliance 
At one time it used to be cost, but thanks to the uh, generics, uh, we have cost under control. And the antidisruptives, we have bisphosphonates, uh, been around for more than two decades, the oral bisphosphonates and then the intravenous bisphosphonates. Uh, probably intravenous bisphosphonates tend to do better because compliance is better. See, the oral bisphosphonate absorption is less than 1%. So the absorption is less, the drug reaching the bone is less, the side effect profile is actually worse than the intravenous bisphosphonate. And as I said, compliance is a big issue. Denosumab has been around uh, in the world for over a decade now, but in India also, we've been using it for more than three years now with very good results. 60 milligrams sub subcutaneously, you get a pre-filled syringe once in six months. The important difference between denosumab and say zolidronic acid as a representative of bisphosphonate is in the first two, three years, you will see nearly the same rise in BMD and nearly the same rise uh, re reduction in fracture risk. But when you go beyond say five years and six years, then that's where denosumab scores because the BMD goes on increasing 10, 12, 13% and the fracture risk goes on reducing. So that's the positive part of denosumab, easy to inject and you can expect benefits for more than three, four years. The negative side of denosumab is that there is no memory. These monoclonal antibodies, the effect starts waning off within two to three weeks of the due date. So if you feel that your patient is not going to be compliant, is not likely to come up for regular follow-up, then IV zolidronic acid is a better option because although we say give it once in 12 months, there is data to suggest you can give it once in 15 months. And there's a very interesting study by Reed et al. from New Zealand, who has looked at giving it once in 18 months with equally good results. The important part when you're starting therapy is to discuss with your patient the period of therapy. See, unlike diabetes or blood pressure uh, or cholesterol, we never talk of period of therapy because it is understood it's going to be practically lifelong. But uh, as you're very well aware, teriparatide, it's 24 months. Oral bisphosphonates, it is five years and maximum of 10 years. IV zolidronic acid is three years and maximum of six years. And the denosumab is maximum of 10 years. So this period of treatment, although we know osteoporosis is a ongoing problem, comes from the safety studies because each of these in long term can cause problems, which I'll refer to in one of the subsequent slides. And you must, that's why I tell them that this is not a two, three, four month therapy. It is a long term therapy. There are drug holidays which you can talk to the patients with bisphosphonates only. Teriparatide has to go on preferably for 24 months. And then because the action will be finished once you stop giving teriparatide, you have to follow it up with an anti disruptive therapy. And I'll give you an interesting study uh, which has come up in the recent past. But you could use either bisphosphonate, IV zolidronic acid, or denosumab. As I said, bone markers are useful uh, in the long term for follow-up of these patients because bone density is not something that you can do every six months or one year. Ideally, it should be done once in two years. With teriparatide, the earliest should be one year. And there was some mention about the onset of action. Actually, the bone fracture risk starts at teriparatide about six months and with the bisphosphonates and denoxomab about nine to 12 months. So prior to this, if the patient does fracture, we don't call it as a failure of therapy. Yeah, if there is a second fracture, then you need to think about something uh, else in the management. So as I was mentioning about this bisphosphonate holiday with uh, the, uh, only with bisphosphonates and you're not here it with denosomab or with teriparatide. And if the BMD score in these ladies has gone above minus 2.5 and they are ready to follow up with a bone marker every six months and probably a BMD every 18 months, you can stop therapy there. As I mentioned, uh, there are studies, 50% of these patients don't adhere to oral therapy and the risk of uh, non-compliance goes on increasing. And that's, that's why the risk of fracture again goes on increasing. Uh, what has become very interesting uh, is that 
when you have severe osteoporosis, so whether it is, uh, uh, say, two vertebral compression fractures, whether it is a score of minus 3.5, whether it's a hip fracture, probably you will be using a bone formation, a anabolic therapy first, and then follow it up with a bone resorption therapy, whether it is zolidronic acid <coughs> or denosumab. But can we combine these two right from the beginning? So the data study, which probably you must be familiar with, has looked at teriparatide in one arm, denosumab in the other arm, and the combination in the third arm. And the BMD increased in all the three, uh, nearly the same, but with the combination therapy, it was significantly more than with either of the two. So this was extended by, so that was for one year and then another one year of therapy in terms of BMD and bone markers. So at the end of 24 months also, you can see uh, with the combination therapy, the dark blue line, there was a progressive increase at all the sites. Uh, somehow, please remember distal radius behaves very differently from the lumbar spine or the hip or the femoral neck. And you should not give that too much of importance because that's more of a cortical bone and these drugs don't work too much on the cortical bone. But in comparison to either of the two, when you look at combination, it seems to do well. So you start your patient on teriparatide and denosumab once in six months for two years and you'll get positive increases in BMD. The other interesting study where, uh, was the switch study. And as the name indicates, for the first two years, it was teriparatide denosumab combination. And then three, third, fourth year, because you've already given teriparatide for two years, you cannot continue that. And here also you've given for two years, so you cannot continue that. So it's denosumab, teriparatide, denosumab in year three and four. So you look at the dark blue line. <clears throat> uh, this was the first two years, which I showed you earlier. And now what happened with the switch study is that the dark blue, which is the teriparatide to denosumab went on increasing. But if you look at denosumab to teriparatide, there is initial drop and then an increase. So you go from anti disruptive to a bone forming agent, there is going to be some delay in the response. So response is going to be there, but there will be some delay and then there is an increase. And if you look at the green, the combination, it's the best. So my take today would be that if you have a high risk patient, if you have a patient with severe osteoporosis, look at combining both teriparatide and denosumab right from the beginning. Two interesting agents expected in India in the next 12 months is romosusumab, which is a bone forming agent, once a month subcutaneously for 12 to 24 months. So this is also a finite period, but the results very briefly, I'm going to just show you one or two slides are very impressive. Uh, in terms of fracture risk reduction uh, and in terms of the uh, BMD increase. And two years of romosusumab followed by one year of denosumab, also you can see that there is a significant increase in BMD and a fracture risk reduction. So you're going to get more of this in the next one year. So this was just to introduce this uh, drug. Abeloparatide, which is a PTH congener, may or may not come to India, but it behaves like teriparatide maybe a little better, but again, 18 month study shows that there is a comparable, comparable increase with uh, amyloparatide and the fracture risk reduction is a little better than that seen with teriparatide. We are all worried about, you know, the side effects. As a matter of fact, in the so-called educative society, the use of these drugs has started going down because of the atypical fractures and the uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, two serious problem. But this slide from Canada is very interesting. 8.4 people per 100,000 persons uh, die in a motor vehicle accident. About 1.8 of 100,000 person years are murdered. And with ONJ, it's less than one year. And with ATP fracture is less than two per 100,000 patients in the early part of treatment and becomes significantly more in eight years of treatment. So that's where this business about uh, drug holiday or bisphosphonate holiday comes up after five years. Give it for five years, your risk of atypical fractures is small. So it's true that these side effects can happen, but for every 100 hip fractures prevented, 
is a chance of one atypical femur fracture. And this is something very interesting uh, in terms of uh, how to pick it up early, how to fix it up before it actually fractures. And you're going to be seeing more of this because the Asians are actually more prone to uh, the atypical fracture as compared to the Caucasians. So this first lady who has osteoporosis, but is not gone into the severe state, you could use any treatment that you are comfortable with in terms of a oral bisphosphonate. Please, I'm not trying to indicate that they're not good. They're very useful, but the compliance factor you have to take care of, they should be able to tolerate it. At this stage, uh, this lady, probably I would have used the IV uh, zolitronic acid once in 18 months, which I was referring to the Ian Reid study from New Zealand, and they seem to do exceedingly well. But once she has fractured, then it's between uh, using a antiresorptive denosumab or zolidronic acid versus the uh, teriparatide, which I was talking about uh, right from the beginning. And uh, as of now, it's not very uh, you know clear whether we should still rush for teriparatide in this patient, if they are elderly, living alone, not going to take treatment. But give it some time, the romosusumab data is very encouraging and probably you will be using the anabolic therapy as a routine first line and followed with the anti-resorptives. Uh, and as in this third case, where probably she's gone into severe osteoporosis and with the age factor, I would discuss the uh, use of teriparatide versus uh, denosumab versus zolidronic acid. And um, maybe uh, depending upon the social status, uh, the economic status, her willingness to take treatment, I would choose between the three drugs. So I'm going to end by saying that osteoporosis is a serious issue, both at personal and the community level. It's easy to diagnose if you think about it. Uh, unfortunately, most doctors, I'm not talking about orthopedic surgeons, even physicians uh, don't look at osteoporosis in their day-to-day -day life as a serious issue. So the old saying, an ounce, a pound, uh, a ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So if you can prevent osteoporosis right from the young age, uh, healthy activity, eating, uh, playing out in the sunshine, bringing uh, a good peak bone mass would be very useful. You start treatment, but if you don't instruct your patients well, if you don't talk to your patients, compliance becomes an issue. And my last statement is, please contact us. Uh, Dr. Kulkarni or Dr. Bijlani will be able to give you my details for those who are interested. We will not interfere with your treatment. We just want to be assured our patient, that patient that is or she is taking treatment. However, off the record, if there is some help that you need from us, we'll be very happy to. Uh, give that to you also. So with this, uh, <clears throat> I will stop. And uh, if we have time, we can take a few questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chada, for uh, being so informative. Now, uh, there are a few uh, questions. So when we talk of osteoporosis, it only uh, flashes when an old lady comes in front of you. All over na nationwide, you know, you don't know when to start being aware of this. Uh, because I have read again and again that it is in the adolescence and middle age that you actually strengthen your bone. And this kind of awareness, what is the right uh, forum to uh, spread this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of knowledge and wisdom? So, uh, <clears throat> I think very important point, if you say you want to prevent osteoporosis, you have to start at birth. The child starts, you know, building up a bone mass, birth onwards, and it uh, increases very rapidly during puberty and somehow peaks around the end of the third decade. After that, there is no increase in bone mass. So that's the importance of a healthy childhood, calcium, vitamin D, exercise, sunlight, and avoiding bone toxins like you know smoking, alcohol, extra salt. You know, Indians tend to have a lot of salt in their diet. Extra salt is also bad. And sometimes the, we need enough proteins, but high protein diet can also leach calcium from the bone. So this uh, bodybuilding may sometimes end up with bone problems. So please start early and work towards preventing osteoporosis. And while we do that, try to prevent the second fragility fracture. And the second is what calcium supplements? That is also a big question. You know, patients keep uh, asking you carbonates or this or that. Okay, so you should give the calcium, which is suitable. I mean, the patient can tolerate. 
so we always say carbonate first because that is the cheapest so if your patient tolerates carbonate please don't go for any expensive carbon uh, any expensive calcium uh, carbonate and citrate maleate probably are the best and then you got fancy calcium which cost much more for those who cannot tolerate calcium so they have gi problems you can use organic calcium you can use orotate and uh, what not but only for those who cannot tolerate the calcium sir i have one question Uh, is there any role of oral biphosphonates? A patient like sixty-five year old female comes to your OPD with a and we do what exercise can she doesn't have a fragility fracture, just uh, a T score and Z scores are low. So would you jump to uh, teriparate and anusama or would you start for savans or? So if you look at the guidelines hmm. from uh, National Osteoporosis Foundation US and the nice guidelines. it is very clearly written that start with oral bisphosphonates because there someone is paying for the drug in india our patient is paying so the question comes up is if you have a better form of therapy where the compliance will be better the incidence of side effects will be less i would prefer that therapy because when you look at the cost of therapy today mm-hmm. once a week oral therapy that's about uh, Hundred odd rupees a year is twelve hundred rupees versus a zolidronic acid, which is about two and a half three thousand rupees. And when I said compliance is much better, I would prefer to go for a parenteral bisphosphonate. However, to answer your question, they are equally good. And if your patient is compliant, because I have seen patients when I tell them once a year, they say, "Oh, this is something very strong. I am not too happy." let me start with oral and then i will look at the injectables okay so still there is a role of oral uh, biphosphonates absolutely yeah sir i have a question sir sure. can i ask no. yeah yeah uh, so uh, many times you see acute patient, patients with acute fractures and uh, they have uh, high pth low vitamin d and calcium is somewhere on the lower side so i personally as in uh, i want to start teriparatide for these fractures so or probably say zolidronic acid so when do we start what is the real risk of hypocalcemia do they i have never seen hypocalcemia so far so what is the real risk of hypocalcemia okay so what you just described is something what, what we call as secondary hyperparathyroidism which is very very common in our patients vitamin d deficiency less calcium getting absorbed the parathyroid glands produce more pth so your picture that you just talked about pth high vitamin d low calcium low normal this should be first treated with vitamin d and calcium the pth will come down within 4 to 6 weeks after that if you want to start teriparatide please go ahead if you want to give bisphosphonates please go ahead but i would correct the pth before i start teriparatide i would correct the vitamin d deficiency before i start the bisphosphonates the risk of hypocalcemia otherwise is pretty high i mean if you have not seen it then probably you are fortunate but we end up seeing the dirty part of the uh, anti disruptives so please ensure <clears throat> that the vitamin d status the calcium in the diet or supplementation and the pth all have been taken care of thank you sir so, so what about uh, itching after inj- uh, starting teriparatide few patients complain of itching yeah so how do you manage so, it are you talking of a local itching or are you talking of generalized generalized itching? generalized itching yeah so uh, you could try this for a few days with the anti allergy one of the cetirizine yeah. or alecra yeah but if that still i mean because i have never seen it as a major uh, deterrent to continuing teriparatide Mm, mm, mm. otherwise you need to really look into their allergy history and find out why they are getting this itching because okay. uh, the teriparatide except for local reactions and some occasional nausea vomiting is very well tolerated mm-hmm. and sir uh, regarding the age of doing the dexa you know uh, our data is always you know we compare with post menopausal female and we think and value the t scores of a 50 year old patient with a post menopausal patient exactly what is the current uh, consensus on that no see uh, two parts to your question dexa in our patients so in our corporate hospitals dexa is done for a 60 year old for a 40 year old for a 25 year old also mm-hmm. that is something which should be totally stopped because we get more problems than good out of it 
I have seen my colleagues giving zolidronic acid plus alendronate to a 30 year old because her scores were low. Remember, even osteomalacia will cause low scores. So most literature says uh, 65 years, 10 years after menopause or 60 years for males. This can be modified to our setting uh, when you have a high risk. And that is why that FRAX needs to be developed uh, see, I have been fortunate, Dr. Sanjay Badada from PGI Chandigarh and I, we've met Dr. John Tannis, the man behind FRAX. And he keeps telling us, send me the Indian data of fracture, fragility fractures, specifically hip fractures. And I'll give you an Indian FRAX of which you all can work on it. So instead of BMD scores and the trabecular bone score, you can do a 10 second calculation on your phone and get a FRAX score. Dr. Chadda, so one the common situation that we see is so patient comes and gets admitted with the compression fracture. He has pain. So you do your bone density. You also, you know, to rule out multiple myeloma, you do a electrophoresis. And M band is positive. So this patient has a very poor bone density as well as a M band. And he has hypercalcemia. So this is a tricky situation. What is... No, I think uh, what you have described is a rare but very important situation. Hypercalcemia, when you see in your patients, you should do a PTH. PTH is elevated, that means this is primary hyperparathyroidism. PTH is not elevated, then you are dealing with a malignancy induced or a granuloma induced hypercalcemia. And multiple myeloma is one of the important contributors in this group. So while you are talking of treating the primary cause, Probably denosumab today is the best option. Prior to that, zolidronic acid was the best option. So these two could be used in your patient while you are sorting it out. Uh, Teriparatide somehow I would not recommend. It's not recommended by literature also in whenever you're dealing with active malignancy or uh, especially bone malignancies. So it will be uh, denosumab versus bisphosphonate. Uh, one question, sir. Uh, so, uh, one of the very tricky si clinical situation is a uh, porotic fracture in a patient with dialysis or uh, chronic renal failure. These are very tricky to uh, deal with. So, even uh, common uh, nephrologists don't add calcitriol in their routine uh, medications. So, once they have a fracture, it is difficult. So, and you can't give teriparatide. Uh, you can't give anything else. You can't give bisphosphonates. So, uh, is bisphosphonate is the answer? I've used it in a couple of patients, but is that the answer? Okay, uh, Manish, you asked a, you know, what we call a question that is very difficult. There's no clear-cut answer to this. You can't use bisphosphonate below 30 ml per minute. You can use denosumab up till 15 ml, stage 4. But since we don't have any other option when the using patient is on dialysis, uh, under observation with proper consent, denosumab is the only option. Because teriparatide also you said cannot be used. I think one of the most difficult things to manage is uh, metabolic bone disease in uh, renal failure. Get this patient uh, transplanted fast and get his renal function fast. So thank you, Dr. Chadha, for uh, being so, uh, you know, having so much of patience and answering all our questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead with our... Uh, uh, stream and discussion. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. See, I have been working with you guys uh, for more than two decades now. So I, I probably I get your regular mails also because of uh, somewhere my name is in the mailing list. And uh, Dr. Agashe was the one who introduced me to you people. And it's always a pleasure to work with you. My only request again is, uh, you know, remember this fracture lies in service. We will not interfere with your treatment. You do what you feel is right. We just ensure that for two years, that your patient takes the treatment. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So I hand over again the baton to uh, Amrit to uh, yeah. you know, go ahead with discussion related to the techniques and then we'll uh, close the session. Okay. Yeah, just a few questions. Coming back to our uh, three, four main panelists. Uh, who are there. So, um, uh, first question to Dr. Um, uh, Arvind Bhave. Uh, Dr. Bhave, yeah. uh, I, I, in your uh, lovely uh, presentation, 
your new uh, uh, device is very interesting. Uh, but uh, in my mind, uh, I would think that with regard to interdigitation of the cement with the bone, I would think that um, vertebroplasty would do a better job in terms of interdigitating that because it is unrestricted. And uh, when somebody with experience knows at what consistency the cement has to go in, yeah. he would do a better job than uh, in your device where there is actually um, uh, there are micro pores, but still it is like a barrier and it doesn't really allow cement. I, I wanted to know your thought. This is yeah. what two points. One is our cadaveric experiments and animal experiments. What we did in the initial phases of this, maybe from 2005 to 2010 where we have taken post-mortem biopsies and confirmed that uh, cement remains separate from the bone. It doesn't interdigitate. That is what uh, thing we had in mind, what you are uh, asking me. And here what happens is, along with the routine uh, bone cement, we are using a biodegradable material also. So it percolates through the uh, implant. It goes in the marrow and we have demonstrated now the increasing new bone formation line, which is integrating with the original marrow of the vertebra. So that is a proof, histopathological proof, that this integrates and only cement doesn't integrate. We have got very good slides, papers have already been publi published in biomedical research. And which shows that cement remains as an inert material of vertebroplasty. So here, what we are trying to achieve is it slowly percolates and there is a pressure theory. Actually, it would have complicated our understanding, but uh, this can be a personal communication also. So once you inject cement, slowly some part of uh, cement is used for inflating the uh, implant and some part of it is used to percolate it outside in the, so this becomes a P1 zone. Now next batch of cement when you inject, the pressure of the injector is more. So it pushes the P1 into P2. So it is a relatively high pressure. So slowly it percolates. It is like putting somebody's uh, arms into arms and then whole chin moves like this. So the implants holds the bone and bone holds the implant. So that is the thing. If you just put a large amount of cement and if osteoporosis occur, we have seen cement getting lost in the abdominal cavities also. Here chances are less because the whole thing's whole assembly is stable because it is holding uh, interdigitation is holding the actual bone marrow and it is around the implant. It is not unidirectional. So there is a better hold. And after uh, these uh, animals which were used for study of this, sacrificed animals, we have taken the, uh, uh, what you say is microscopic studies and it has been shown that this uh, rising or the growing bone, the line of growing bone, line of new osteocytes, it's seen getting percolated with the cement mass. So that is a proof that it is interdigitating. Just in other uh, samples where we had used fewer, only vertebral uh, cement, that is polymethyl methacrylate, it forms a layer around it and then bone tissue is separate from it. Even you can see if you are doing revision, total knee or total hip, you can see a clear cut demarcating line between the cement interface, there is an in between layer and then bone. So, interdigitation right. means it is extending. And now we are using biodegradable material also. And that you can see the increasing, or it is like a tide of new tissue coming inside that interdigitation. That we have slides and proved it to USFD also. So, we can produce it anytime, no problem. Right. So, um, there is a question for you. Right. It's a million dollar question which I have not been able to solve for the last uh, 15 years. So, how to avoid cement leakage from fractured superior end plate during vertebroplasty? Uh, very difficult. So you cannot avoid. You just have to stop. As soon as you see leakage, you have to stop and redirect your probably the needle. Yeah. But if you anticipate that it is going to uh, uh, leak into the superior end plate through the end plate, very likely that's a it is going to develop a discovertebral instability i might consider uh, doing a fixation uh, 
about it. I would like to hear Dr. Bhave's uh, opinion on this also. Yeah, same thing I had in mind when we started vertebroplasty and we had a few leaks initially. And then I met a who uh, propagates discoplasties just with cement injections. Right. And when I confirmed these results, he says even in scoliosis cases, he just injects uh, cement in the intradiscal space and that gives good correction. That was, uh, this lecture was there in one of the Mumbai ASICONs. Actually, Arvind might remember it. So he had presented his data and that is another thing. And even our tumor uh, specialist uh, from, uh, he had also confirmed that it is happening and they are doing even for secondaries in spine, they are doing discoplasties to stabilize where the long fixations is not possible or it is not, uh, patients are not getting ready for long fixation, long fusions after tumor surgeries. So the, even if it leaks, because usually we stop once you start leaking, even it's once it start leaking in the end space, and by and large it doesn't cause any problem. Many times patients, if they have discogenic pain, that also reduces because the whole assembly gets stabilized. What about this talk, sir? Perhaps with the intradiscal leak, what about adjacent level collapse? It doesn't, doesn't happen. happen. No. Doesn't happen. No. So that. Bhave sir, the talk that you were uh, referring to was for degenerative scoliosis. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was a Hungarian guy. Uh, I forgot his Hungarian name. Hungarian was also there and French guy was also there. Hungarian was in Pune. Yeah. And uh, French. Uh, but I think it will be a bit difficult to compare degen scoliosis uh, from. Uh, uh, no, no, he was injecting huge amount of uh, cement yes. in the discs and that to multiple discs. And whatever your leak is going to occur is hardly going to be less than 1 cc. So I don't think it causes any issue. Yeah, even I have seen CC, four CCs in each disc. As against whatever leak you see on CRM, you just stop. You don't go on continuing the, your leak. So what amount of cement you are going to inject in that uh, end plate or through the burst end plate is hardly less than one CC. So I don't think it causes any significant side effects. Most of the question, uh, what is the ideal amount of cement that needs to be injected? Yeah, uh, for this, we have done biomechanical uh, experiments and similar papers have already come in the literature. What they say is uh, usual uh, strength of the uh, vertebral body can be achieved with 30% volume of the pre-fracture uh, vertebra. So if you if a volume is say 9 cc and 30% becomes 3 cc. So in Indian, osteopor Indian thoracic, lower thoracic or upper lumbar, we have usually volumes up to 15 cc. And in lumbar, we have volumes up to 20 to 25 cc. So even if you make one third of the cement, that is, I'm talking of PMMA alone, not biodegradable cement. So they have got coefficient of hardening similar to uh, the actual bone mass. So even if you inject 30%, it forms a similar strength like an adjacent segment. If you exceed that, then it becomes hard like a cricket ball and then it causes pressure on the adjacent. So now we have series, we are analyzing our series of around 325 cases and we had only two adjacent level fractures after vertebroplasty. As a, where we have used this principle that uh, volume of the cement is not to exceed 30% of the pre-fracture volume. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, the entire faculty and all the viewers. Uh, so we have to we have to wrap up. We are we are short one hour beyond time. Uh, so thanks, Amrit, thank for moderating <laughs> the session and yeah. uh, all thank others for your contributions. Uh, I have a, an, an uh, exciting announcement to make. Can I uh, share the screen? So, uh, Misabi is organizing, it's uh, it's not our, actually our annual conference, so we haven't met for the last uh, one and a half years. So, generally we have uh, a live, cadaver, live uh, surgery and cadaveric demonstration session in April, so it goes on for three days and that is generally held in Bangalore. Uh, we take advantage of the facilities there at uh, uh, MS Ramaya uh, Cadaveric Centre and we generally have live surgeries at 40s. So this uh, that is uh, uh, that is something which delegates uh, uh, you know wait for, but that was not possible last year and that is not possible this year too at least in the beginning. So we have uh, reversed our gear. Uh, so we have our annual 
uh, it's not the annual conference, but we have a big uh, uh, surgical symposium which will be uh, uh, held on 9th and 10th uh, and uh, of April. And uh, Dr. Omesh uh, Srikanta and Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande uh, uh, from Bangalore will be the coordinators, uh, organizers for uh, this virtual session. Uh, so it'll be there'll be a fantastic display of live surgeries from three different uh, locations in India. These are live surgical uh, demonstrations, and we have plenty and plenty of video sessions around the clock. Apart from that, there will be debates, there will be uh, interactive discussions, and a big platform for youngsters to uh, come and present their work. The total focus will be on youngsters, and obviously there will be best paper awards, presentations, etc. The details will, uh, uh, you will get flyers related to this uh, on a regular basis by WhatsApp, email, etc. And uh, we'll also let you know how to register. So we want to, uh, you to, you know, uh, participate uh, wholeheartedly and uh, take advantage and contribute uh, to the sessions. So keep, uh, so please uh, block your dates and uh, uh, so hear from us. So the next uh, uh, NISA webinar will be on the second uh, Sunday of uh, February again early in the morning. So uh, look forward to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Thank you. Thank you.